Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is May 17th, 2021. And today, uh, we are super excited to have back in our studio for part two, Drew Manning. Hey, Drew. Hey, John. Thanks for having me back. Thanks for coming back. My pleasure. <laughs> So for those who uh, haven't checked out part one yet, go check it out. Uh, if, uh, if you did, then you know that Drew Manning is best known across the world as the founder of Fit to Fat to Fit. Um, it's an exercise uh, social media platform website. There's a podcast. There's all sorts of, uh, sorts of cool stuff. But uh, we spent uh, several hours with Drew a few days ago, just talking about his Mormon story, his Mormon journey, super powerful, uh, really vulnerable. And, uh, but we didn't get enough from Drew and how could you get enough from Drew? And so we have him back to talk a little bit more. Um, in, in the previous episode, we talked about his, his Mormon story, his Mormon journey, um, a lot of the shame that he experienced as a youth growing up um, in a very large family very large Mormon family. We talked about his uh, mission, his sort of uh, becoming a faithful Mormon, serving a mission, getting married uh, in the temple, and his Mormon marriage. And we also talked about how uh, the the shame that he uh, experienced as a Mormon boy and a Mormon youth sort of bled into his marriage. And a lot of, uh, one of the most powerful things for me in the story was just hearing about um you know, how shame around pornography and masturbation affected him and, and his marriage, ended up uh, doing a lot of the the typical, you know, 12-step uh, addiction recovery stuff. But long story short, um, it, it this whole shame stuff was a contributing factor to the end of his marriage. Um, he also talked a lot about his faith crisis. And the way that we ended last episode was sort of with uh, his faith crisis him and his his uh, ex-wife leaving the church and the marriage ending. And we have so much that we wanted to cover, hmm. including him rebuilding a life of, of healing and growth and positivity and connection. Um, we'll talk a little, about, a little bit about his uh, experimentation with psychedelics and ayahuasca, how that was formative on his journey. And we also want to talk about fit to fat to fit. So there's a lot we want to talk about. Drew, what, what would you want to correct or add or change to that introduction? Anything? That's a good question. Thanks for allowing me to. I think I, you know, I covered a lot of, I think most of the details that I wanted to get across. I think a couple of things that I probably skipped over were, uh, one, you know, Lynn and I, even though we went through this horrible divorce and it was so hard for her, so hard for me, we've both come to this place of healing where she's done the work and I've done the work. And so we're in this place now where we co-parent really well. If you follow me on social media, you'll see us at Christmas together, Halloween together, Easter. Mm. Um, you know, I'm friends with her, her fiance as well. And so it's, it's a modern family kind of setup where it works for us because, you know, me reading books like Ego is the Enemy, which I highly, highly recommend to anyone that's going through a divorce because you see how much suffering is caused by your ego. And for me, that really helped me. Uh, discern when my ego's kind of um, in play in certain situations and I can check myself and say, okay, is this really my high self, what I want to do? Or is this my ego trying to tell me, you know, what you deserve or what you should do and how to treat other people? So for me, um, you know, I have a healthy grateful. divorce. Yeah. I'm super grateful to be friends with my ex-wife because I think in divorce situations, the kids are the ones that end up suffering at the expense of the parent's ego. Right. And so, um, we'll talk a bit about that, how to yeah. have a healthy divorce. Yeah. Oh okay. man. <laughs> That's a good question because, um, I'm, like I said, I'm super grateful that Lynn was willing to do the work. It, this doesn't apply to everyone because if you could be the most willing person to fix yourself and heal yourself, but if your ex spouse isn't willing to put in the work, it makes it, you know, you know, so much harder to deal with their wounds and their hurt. And, um, when people are hurt, they hurt other people. So yeah, hurt, hurt people, people. Are hurt, yeah, hurt people, right? Absolutely. And so when someone's hurt and they're trying to hurt you, it's hard not to take it personally. And so I've had to really learn in that situation with me and my ex-wife and her too, where when you're hurt and you're lashing out at someone to hurt them, you learn not to take it personally. You, you learn to take a step back and not let your ego get in the way. Yeah. And that's, you know, years and years of practicing that totally. with her. There's been ups and downs where we've disagreed on some things, but like it would break my heart if I couldn't spend 
Christmas morning with my girls because I don't get along with their mom. Yeah. You know, and that would break their heart too, probably. Yeah. So. All right. So we'll talk about all that today. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and we're super happy to have back with us in studio, uh, Kara. Hey. Uh, Nuance Ho. Welcome back, Kara. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I loved Drew's interview last time and we didn't get into enough stuff. So I'm just happy to be here. And Thank you're producing. You. I'm yes. producing. I got my hands on all these buttons. I've got like <laughs> post-it notes of all the shit I need to do. So it's going to be all professional. Sorry for swearing. Oh, we're glad to have you. <laughs> yeah, we glad expect to you to. Yeah. <laughs> <No. laughs> okay, so so last we left off, mm -hmm. um, your marriage was kind of uh, about to end and you were losing and you'd lost your faith. Yeah. So let's maybe, let's pick it up from there. Did you, did you kind of leave the church first? Mm-hmm at least in your mind, or did your marriage end first? Which happened first? I knew the marriage was ending. So here's here's where we were. We we actually moved to Hawaii in 2015, to the big island of Hawaii, which is where my family's from on my dad's side. So me, my ex-wife, we hadn't been divorced officially yet, but we were, we knew it was over. We moved our, our, ourselves and our two girls to Hawaii to as a divorced family to go through our transition out there. Everyone from Utah knows the culture of Utah. And when everyone's up in your business, it can be a lot. And for me, doing the fit to fit to fit thing, people knew who I was. They knew who Lynn was. It was so much uh, better and healing for us to go to a place like Hawaii where people didn't really know who we were. They didn't you know, know what fit to fit to fit was. And it was just an escape almost to be able to heal without people being up in your business. How much of that was just divorce and how much of that was the Mormon aspect of leaving your faith because mm -hmm. Margie and I had to leave Logan after I lost my <laughs> faith and got excommunicated. We stayed a couple of years, but it was yeah. really toxic. And I know a lot of couples that one of the ways they deal with having a Mormon faith crisis, especially if they're in Utah mm -hmm. is they need to move. And I yeah. don't, I don't recommend that for everyone, but your move to Hawaii, how much was. Yeah. I think it was a little bit of a combination of both, both the, the divorce and the culture of, of people just being up in your business. And I just, yeah, there was a lot of shame and guilt. Like I had the opportunity to go to a different state and go attend church there. Cause we still attended church in Hawaii for the first little bit. We still attended church for the, a little bit, but you know, like I said on the last episode, when I learned of the 2015 policy that had happened where it was leaked at that moment, I knew that things were, were, were being made up. Like these are men doing the best they can with the, the knowledge that they have and their experiences. And that's all they are just men that, you know, sometimes make mistakes. And this was a mistake. And I think everyone knew it but it was hard to admit it to ourselves. And for me, after reading the Mormon essays and the CES letter, I was like, okay, I see that these prophets in the past have made mistakes. And then that policy happened. I'm like, this is a perfect example of, I know looking back on like, you know, Brigham Young, it's easy to be like, oh, he made a mistake and he's a product of his time. I know 50 years from now, we're gonna look back at that 2015 policy and be like, yeah, that was a mistake, right? I think everyone's gonna admit that. Um, and so that was a moment for me to kind of say, no, I get to choose and pick what I feel is true. And I feel like this isn't true and this is wrong and this isn't right. This isn't, you know, I'm not just going to blindly follow this. And so we were in Hawaii at the time, you know, uh, we went to church maybe, you know, once a week, sometimes as a family because we lived together and we, um, slowly we just stopped going. <laughs> it wasn't like all of a sudden, like I'm done. It was like, you know what? I'm going to go uh, hike out in nature. I'm going to go to the beach. I'm going to go meditate. I'm going to go journal. And I feel way more connected to God in those situations than I do, you know, going to church. And so for me, that's kind of how I was able to eventually find peace with, um, you know, after leaving your religion, it can be scary. You lose a part of your identity. You, uh, for me, I lost my identity in my divorce and my religion around the same time because we knew we were getting divorced by the time, even when we, before we moved out to Hawaii, we knew it was going to happen eventually. We lived together for about six months out there, and then she transitioned into her house, uh, and then I st stayed in, in uh, my apartment where I was at, and so we split time with the girls. But up until that point, we were living together as a as a family. Um, one of the one of the things that kind of people who are losing their faith in the church have to decide is: do I do I mm -hmm. actually leave the church, or do I just either just go inactive, or mm -hmm 
semi-active where I just keep up appearances, go when I feel like it, even raise the kids as a non-believer. Yeah. There is a path of staying in the church as a non-believer or as a semi-believer yeah. just because it's your cultural heritage, just because you're afraid, can I raise healthy moral kids without the church? Yeah. Did you guys toy with that option of either staying in as mm -hmm. semi or non-believers and or just having to be a cultural thing yeah. Not necessarily a literal believing thing. Yeah, I think you know that's why we 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 tried that. I think for a little bit when we moved to the Tongan branch that I mentioned here in Utah, we went to a different branch and yeah. and we both got callings and you know we were okay with that. But then when we transitioned to Hawaii, out there it was okay. Let's go to church as semi believers or you know it's a good thing to go with family because my brother lived out there. And so we would go to church with him and his family and bring our girls. And, um, I, we try to make it work like semi believing, you know, and uh, okay, what, what good things are happening here? Maybe if I just look for the good things and anywhere you go, any church you go to, you're going to find good things. Right. So I was like, okay, I'll come. I'll listen for the good things. The things I don't agree with, I'll just stay quiet about, <laughs> and I won't, you know, I, I just won't, rock the boat for anyone and say, actually, I disagree with that. Or actually, you know, I've learned this and, and I think we're, you know, kind of lying to ourselves, you know, in, in a sense. So we try to make it work, but eventually I just found myself, I needed to discover who I was without the church. And to do that, I had to leave the church because in the church, you're told who to be, you're told how to think, you're told how to behave outside of the church. I was like, I've done that my whole life. Now I need to figure out who I really am without being told Mm -hmm. who, you know, who I am. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so leaving the church and, and going to, like I said, going out in nature, journaling, meditating was, uh, were tools that I used to help discover who I was without that. And it was so freeing once I did that, once I left the, the, the church and, and tried these new methods that, you know, I wasn't used to, they were super powerful for me. Um, so meditation, positive affirmations, gratitude lists and journaling and getting out in nature were five methods that I used to really discover who I was. Also listening to books and podcasts was a huge help in finding this, this new version of myself. Okay. You just gave a list of five things. Yes. Or were each of those really fundamental? 100%. Okay. We talk about each one sure. individually. Yeah. So okay. meditation, I'll start there. Okay. Meditation. I grew up in, in in the United States. I didn't, didn't know anyone that meditated growing up unless you were a, a monk or mm -hmm. I don't know, something yeah. like that. <laughs> so Mormons don't really meditate or exactly. at least not explicitly. Yeah, because it's not practiced or taught in our religion, right? Or in the culture of the church. But learning it from people, I listen to a lot of Tim Ferriss podcasts. I listen to Joe Rogan sometimes. And then these guys are talking about meditation and same thing with Tony Robbins as a tool. It was more of like a scientific perspective on meditation. So I'm like, okay, maybe there's something to it. So I downloaded some free apps. I put my headphones in. So there's Headspace, Calm, there's Calm. Were, were the two I started with. Calm, Mar Mark uses Calm. Yeah, Insight yeah. Timer is a really good one too. Yep, Insight Timer. Because I don't know how to meditate. Right. I just thought you sit there <laughs> yeah, and just, exactly, all right, don't yeah. think about anything, you know, for 10 minutes. Like that's, that's, that's torture, right? Yeah. But learning how to do it and being present in the moment helps you to detach yourself from your thoughts. So, and, and for me, meditation, what it does, it helps me become the observer of my thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that's your true identity. You are the observer of your thoughts. The problem is that we attach ourselves to our thoughts because that's human nature. And we react to those thoughts. We react to those emotions, those triggers that happen in life. Meditation helps you take a step back and just observe how you normally would react and say, okay, is this serving my highest self if I just react this way? Right. Or should I thoughtfully respond to this situation right. and think about it a little bit more before reacting? And so meditation was huge in helping me be present in the moment, truly be present with me, my girls. Um, and that really helped to discover who I was. And so meditation is huge. I actually use that in my health and fitness training with clients. I have them practice meditation because it does translate over into other areas of your life like physical fitness. And it has huge benefits for that. So it's not just the spiritual benefits, there's physical, mental, and emotional benefits by meditating. Uh, the next thing is positive affirmations. Now, Every time I bring up positive affirmations, I always think of Stuart Smalley from Saturday Night Live, where he's super cheesy and he's like, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me, right? Everyone that knows Saturday Night Live knows that clip. So I had a hard time getting into it because I'm like, this sounds so weird. Like I'm talking out loud. I'm saying words like I love you to myself like out loud. And it's 
very weird at first, but it's super powerful because I never heard those words spoken to me mm. until that point. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people out there might be able to relate to that. If, if no one's ever told you that you're worthy of love or that you're lovable, why not tell yourself that? And so for me, positive affirmations, yeah, it's kind of corny saying these words out loud to yourself about yourself, but it was super powerful to say, you know, to myself, like, I love you. You are worthy. You're a good man. You're a good father. You're, you're, you're all these things that I never really heard growing up. And so that was the first time that I heard those words spoken to myself about myself. And that's why they were so powerful. And we all know that there's that words are, um, words uh, affect us at the cellular level. You know, you've seen those studies with rice and li living plants where they speak kind words or mean words and they show the difference after like 30 or 60 days. Imagine what that does to us, you know, as humans. And so positive affirmations is something that I have my clients and my followers do as well because there needs to be some kind of belief that you are worthy of, of maybe a happier, more fulfilled life. So positive affirmations. Uh, really so when would you do, do that. that to you? How, like, would you just in the morning do it before? Yeah. So I do meditation and then uh, say three to five things about myself to myself that I'm maybe having a, a, a tough time believing, you know, or something that what are I some struggled examples? with. What are some examples? Yeah. Um, I've said some of them, like I, I am oh, worthy right. of love. Okay. I'm proud of who I am. Um, I love myself. I love my body. I uh, am and a good like man. you're like looking in the mirror saying Yeah, looking in the mirror to yourself and that's, it's powerful. And so I recommend people do it for a minimum of 30 days, every single day, right after your meditation, go straight into that. Whether you believe those words or not, doesn't matter. There's power in saying those words out loud to yourself. Okay. So that was huge for me to start to believe in myself that I was mm. worthy of love. Cause I remember my, in my last episode, I talked about hating myself. Mm -hmm. I wasn't worthy of anything. And, and my method of improving was through self hate discipline. Like most guys uh, try and do. Uh, the next thing was a gratitude list. And this is three to five things similar uh, to positive good. affirmations, but three to five things you're grateful for. And that helps to rewire your brain to Help. actually look for things in your life that are positive. Even though you feel like your life sucks, if you're going through a divorce, a bankruptcy, whatever, an excommunication, <laughs> anything like that, I promise you, you will still be able to find something to be grateful for. So how often are you doing this? In, uh, every morning. Every morning you're listing three to five things you're grateful for. Yes. Okay. So meditation, positive affirmations, go make myself some coffee because I drink coffee now. And Was that scary <laughs> to start drinking coffee? No, nah, it was cool. I was excited. I was like, man, finally I can. <laughs> uh, but like similar to like alcohol, I'm like, I don't know what to order. Uh, you know, just coffee and, you know, I don't drink sugar, so I don't add sugar to mine. But um, now I, yeah, I coffee is my morning ritual Okay. and I love it. Um, so I'll sip on coffee while I do my journaling, you know, my, my gratitude list, three to five things. And if you could do that every single day, you start to realize, man, I have so many things to be grateful for. Mm -hmm. And then you start to look for things throughout the day to be right. grateful for. Exactly. And like I said, it helps to rewire your, 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 uh, neural pathways in your brain so that you actually are more fulfilled, not in receiving things in life, not getting to this goal, but in, uh, the pursuit of it and the process of becoming this new version of yourself you can be fulfilled now while you're working on that better version of yourself. So that's another thing I have my clients and followers do, <laughs> um, you know, as a daily gratitude list. And then what was the last thing? Oh, getting out in nature. You know, I don't care if you live in New York city or downtown Salt Lake, getting out in the sun, taking your shoes off and standing in some grass or going to a beach, like where I was in Hawaii. It's, it's very healing. How? And, um, I think humans, uh, we've been detached from mother nature, you know, ever since we've become more and more civilized, people n n very rarely leave their home unless it's in a car, you know? So I think as humans, there's something about being out in nature that there's an energy that you, you can, um, be in tune with when you're out there and just be present, right? So going on a hike in the mountains or, uh, being at the beach or, um, just getting out and getting some sun, some vitamin D, not only from a health perspective, is that healthy? but the therapeutic benefits you get from being out in nature as well. So these kinds of things I think are really, really helpful in anyone going through, whether you're going through a faith transition or any kind of transition in life, I feel like getting out in nature at some point in time is going to be huge as far as benefits that'll bring into your life. Love it. Yeah. So did you say there were five things? Cause I think we got four, we got meditation, positive, positive affirmations, gratitude, gratitude list, list and getting out in podcasts. Nature.
And oh, oh pod- yeah, podcast. But was books. that the fifth or was there a different one? Um, Not to be like Mormon stories or like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you want to talk about us or anything? No, 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 no. <laughs> Damn, man. I wish we could go back and roll that clip. What, did I, what was the fifth one? It, it, you said podcast was one of them, but. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, it would be podcast and audio books. Education. Yeah. yeah. Education. Yeah. Like listening to other people's perspectives. If you only listen or if you only listen to your church leaders and read the Book of Mormon and the church magazines, that's all you're going to know. Like that's, yeah. that's your bubble you live in. Yeah. But if you read. Brene Brown, if you read um, uh, Ryan Holiday and um, some amazing books that I've read over the years, like uh, Don Miguel Ruiz, uh, his books are amazing. The Four, the four Agreements, Agreements, the yeah. Fifth Agreement. These kind of books that exist that in the Mormon world, we don't really explore outside of you know the books that we're given because we're told all the answers are in this one book, yeah. right? Um, and I feel like finally I was, my eyes were open to this other world that existed where all these things were so much more helpful for me because they applied to my situation so much more than, you know, you don't hear about faith transition or divorce in the Bible or the book of Mormon, right. And how to navigate that through a psychological perspective, but these books really do. And that's why when I went to my life coach, Catherine Dixon, her methods of using Byron Katie's, um, um, the work that was so helpful for me because I never experienced that before. And that's why that, that experience with her, that three hour first session was the first time I learned to love myself. And I actually saw a light at the end of this tunnel that I was stuck in because these methods that she used, I never would have been open to it because it's like, Oh, that's, she's not from the church. And you know, I I don't think that will really help me. And now that I've broken free from that, kind of got out of the matrix, if you will, now I'm open to these other things and I'm like, man, where was this th- my whole life? I could have used this mm-hmm. so much in my past, but luckily, fortunately I did. So podcasts and books, uh, yeah. books um, are great to help change your perspective of your situation, right? If you could shift your perception of your situation, that's how you'll find true happiness. Not necessarily sh- changing your situation, but shifting your perception of your situation. And then I started to look at myself not as a failure anymore. I didn't define myself by my past and I owned my story. And now I could show up as this authentic version of me and not be afraid with what other people think. Like if I'm going to drink coffee, I'm not going to hide it from my family. If I'm going to drink alcohol, I'm not going to hide it from people who I used to be afraid of uh, of them and what they thought about me. Now it's like, look, I, I am, I know who I am. I love myself. I'm proud of who I am. And these things don't define me. If I drink coffee, if I drink tea, if I drink alcohol, you know, if I don't go to church on Sunday, I'm not defined by those things. And I think breaking free from that was really hard for me because in the church, there's so much guilt and shame around. If you do this, you're going to feel bad. And like I said, getting out of the matrix, <laughs> you realize, man, I have the power to break free from that and, and finally have a good relationship with myself. And I think, honestly, that's what God wants for all of us. So that's why I don't feel like, God wants everyone in the Mormon church <laughs> because I feel like there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of happy people in the Mormon church, but there's also a lot of miserable, miserable people in the Mormon church too. And outside the church as well, both, both of those exist. <clears throat> and so for me, I feel like, you know, if, if there is a God, he would want us to love ourselves. And if you don't love yourself in a certain, yeah. you know, context or um, a certain, you know, uh, being a part of a certain church, maybe that's not the healthiest thing for you. You know, mm-hmm. even though you've been told to stay here and that's where you'll find happiness, I feel like we're all on different paths and there's so many, everyone's path is so unique and different. And I think we should celebrate that instead of say, no, you're supposed to be on this path. Yeah. Every one of those items, being in nature, meditating, mindfulness, just all of those things. I, I don't do the self-affirmations, but I can see now how I benefit from it. But I just want to say that the the idea of mm-hmm. books and podcasts, we're raised as Mormons to think that that the wisdom comes from the scriptures and <clears throat> prophets, seers, and revelators. Yeah. And when you start to lose your faith, immediately you think, well, I'm going to lose the scriptures. I'm going to lose these prophets, mm-hmm. seers, and revelators. And yeah. it feels like a loss. <clears throat> but immediately you could you realize, oh my gosh, this isn't a loss. This is a huge expansion. Yeah. Your prophets can become Brene Brown. Mm-hmm. They can become, uh, who's the cheetah author that's really popular right now? Um, oh, um, yeah. Uh, 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 Glennon Doyle, Glennon right? Doyle. yeah. Uh, She's awesome. Maya Angelou, Eckhart mm-hmm. Tolle. Like there are so many prophets of wisdom and truth, but actually real Sam Harris, you know, whoever yeah. it is, there's so many people out there that have wisdom, uh, expertise, 
you know, marriage advice, uh, you know, there's so many sources of wisdom and books and podcasts can, yeah. it's like brain food. It's like soul food yeah. and you don't trade down by losing, you know, the quorum of the fifth 12 and the, and the first presidency, a bunch of honestly, with respect, white dudes from Idaho and mm -hmm. Utah that have been saying the same thing for decades and decades and decades, mm -hmm. not necessarily adding a lot of wisdom. All of a sudden you trade up to these yeah. amazing people who've lived amazing, inspiring lives. I just have to echo that and yeah. say that <clears throat> that is a huge benefit to going through a faith crisis. Yes. For amen. Sure. I agree with that 100%. Yeah. Thanks for letting me and talk that. And most of that is free too. <laughs> you don't have to pay a tithe to that. 10%. Um, I mean, most of life is like looking for the fountain of youth, looking for like the secret sauce of what makes a happy, fulfilling life. And it's difficult when you're in the church and you're like, I must be the one that's doing something wrong yeah. because the answers that I'm told is supposed to be so fulfilling. I'm still left empty. I'm still left hungry. Yeah. And you feel a little, I don't know if you felt guilty as well, of like going through that transition, wondering uh, if it's okay to start looking for an authority outside of these, these men and these leaders. Um, I, I had to deconstruct that as well that early so on huge. that yeah. you're like, maybe they don't have all the answers. Maybe uh, there is a, a good trade up to the, to this <clears throat> other, like further light and knowledge, you know? Yeah. And Kara, you, I think you brought up the most difficult and important part of a faith crisis, which is changing mm -hmm. the locus of authority and control from some external source to you feeling comfortable yeah. Yeah. making your own decisions and being your own moral authority. Did you have to, did you have to do that? Yeah, 100%. Because I had totally 100% trusted the leaders of the church, the my church leaders and my bishops and stake presidents as these guys hold the keys and therefore they are uh, the ones I need to be listening to. And then to get into this world of like, hey, I can think for myself and hey, I can uh, uh, find my way out of this um, and I have the power to do that. I have the power to be happy without someone telling me, hey, you're you're guilty and you're, you're sinful and you're dirty. It's, it's breaking free from that. It did take some time. But once you, I think, once you really discover who you really are outside of the church and you have that uh, authentic relationship finally with yourself, I feel it's so much easier to transition to where it's like, hey, I'm going to listen to this book and this podcast and I don't care what anyone says or I'm going to drink this coffee and I don't care what anyone thinks. Letting go of that, of what other people think about you is so hard to break free from, but it's so freeing. I think a lot of people are just stuck there because we worry about what our parents are going to think or church leaders or friends and we do things for them and then you lose yourself in that. And I think so many people are stuck in that place where they're doing things for other people instead of doing things for themselves. And they look at that as maybe being selfish or, or whatever, but we know that that's not selfish. Loving yourself is not selfish, <laughs> you know? And I think that's a huge lesson that I learned during that, that transition. And um, like I said, it took, it took a while to get there, but I'm so grateful for these things outside of this Mormon bubble that I grew up in that were able to help me navigate this life to find happiness and fulfillment. Because I think a lot of people, whether they're in the church or not, when they're when you're a part of a certain religion, you feel like, oh, everyone else is miserable. Only us, we're, we're the happy ones, right? Because we have the <laughs> truth and everyone else must be sad and lonely. And then you realize you've been lied to about that. You're like, man, actually, I'm so much happier now without the confines of this you know, religion that tells me what to do and what to think. And it, I know that I can't convince people of that, but I know for myself that I'm happier, like 100% happier to be outside, even though I was told my whole life, oh, if you go down that path, it'll lead to misery and no, sin. No, you're taught wickedness. You know, there is nothing more <laughs> wicked than leaving the truth. Yeah. And you're taught wickedness never was happiness. Yes, it's so true. That's, But that's not what you experienced. No. You're saying you upgraded your happiness. 100%. To get out of the, uh, the guilt and the shame cycle uh, is probably one of the most freeing experiences mm. I've ever had. And to not yeah. feel guilt and shame constantly every single day for what I do or what I don't do or what I drink or what I don't drink. I mean, I, that's how I feel like God wants us to live this life. Like if there is a God, he wants us to like, he would want us to live it this way, right? Where we are happy um, and true because that's what we want for our kids, right? You want your kids to be truly happy, right? No matter, no matter what they do. And yeah, you could, you might say, I know better. And this is the, that true happiness that, for you. But we all know what happens if you try and force that on your kids and saying, hey, this is the, the way to happiness is my way. But they're a different individual. They're a different human. They're going to have different beliefs and different experiences. And you could either love them through that or you can try and, you know, keep them in this bubble where you think they'll be safer, <laughs> you know. Do you feel like you've become a better parent? 
Um, I think so. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about that. I feel like I am because one, I know how to be present with my girls. And when I, when I'm present with my girls, they know that I'm there for them. They know that I'm listening versus, you know, I mean, like I said, nothing against my parents. I just feel like with 11 kids, it, it's impossible to give your kids attention and to be truly present with them. Cause my mom was having to fix three meals a day for 11 kids. And you know, my dad, my dad worked all day and you could just imagine the chaos, but I feel like I'm 100% a better parent because I know how to empathize with my girls and listen to them and be present with them. These kinds of tools that I learned outside of Mormonism, I never would have learned in Mormonism. So yes, I'm a, I'm a better parent and I'm sure my ex-wife, if she was on here, she'd probably agree with that too. So. But Heavenly Father is kind of always taught to you, like he's the model that you're supposed to, he's, he's our father. We want to model our parenting after the way that he is taught. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Sorry, I'm not explaining myself. Yeah. Well, but that, that the way that he is our father, we want to model our, our parenting after the way that Heavenly Father parents us, I sure. guess. And it's not until you deconstruct the religion that you're like, I could do better. I think I have some better ideas about how <laughs> I want to interact with my kids. Torment. Yeah. 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 Um, and that there's lots of better parenting advice outside of than just the Mormon <laughs> construct. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. So, okay. <clears throat> let's do a quick firing round okay. um, of, of just some other questions. So if you're not Mormon, mm -hmm. Let's talk about identity for a second. Yeah. And this is just one minute. Who, okay. who are you if you're not Mormon? That's a good question. Um, well, I know who I am. I am me. I'm Drew. I'm this man, the f a father, and um, someone that loves himself and is proud of, of who, I've, I, who I am and who I've become. And, um, you know, but I will say this. I think we are a collection of all of our past experiences. So growing up in the church, growing up in the family I grew up in, there's little things, experiences that are still, that have still shaped me into who I am today. So I can't say that I am who I am today without mentioning that I grew up Mormon because mm -hmm. that probably yeah, it's part of you. Yeah, changed, you know, the way I viewed the world in a certain sense. And, and, you know, for example, like, um, um, let me think if this is a good example or not. I feel like because I had certain experiences that were bad, now I want to have the opposite experiences of that because I've had those bad experiences. But had I not had those bad experiences first, I probably wouldn't be, you know, as adamant about discovering this, the opposite side of that, where like, oh, the, like I want this definitely because I didn't have this, right? So because I didn't have this, that kind of um, led me down this path of wanting the opposite of that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So had I not had those experiences, I probably wouldn't be who, I, who I, I was today. So Mormonism did have a role in helping shape who I am today. But because I went through that, and saw the bad things. Now I'm like, okay, I don't want that. I don't want the guilt and the shame all the time. I want this, this, uh, freedom, this, uh, authentic, this authentic life. But because I didn't have that before, yeah, maybe I desire it more because I went through that experience. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, okay. Next question. I'll just do a firing round. Okay. And then Kara's got a question. <laughs> um, morality. Yeah. So, um, there's this idea that if you don't have the Mormon church telling you what to do, then you'll become a, a alcoholic. You'll become a drug mm -hmm. addict. You'll become lurid, licentious, and vile. You'll mm -hmm. sleep around in ways that are harmful to your. You'll get people pregnant yeah. if you're a guy. You'll get all sorts of STIs. You know, you'll cheat on your spouse, or you'll yeah. you know you'll become a philanderer. Um, you won't be honest. Why would you be honest? In fact, yeah. why wouldn't you even kill people? Because you you don't have any. I mean, there are people, yeah. especially once they start wondering if they still believe in God or Jesus. The, the believers, you know, believers will say, well, then why would you do anything good at all in your life? Yeah. You're just going to descend into debauchery. How have you reconstructed a moral center? Yeah, that's a really- Or really, have you? Yeah, no, I feel like I have. I, I, that's a really good question. And I think that's why um, it's so important to discover who you are outside of the church, outside of the religion, because you've been told who to be your whole life. And yes, you have to credit religion for- putting those structures in place so that humans don't just kill each other all the time. But to say that every human is going to be bad without religion is a, a pretty ridiculous re assumption, first of all. And it's also a scare tactic or fear-based uh, belief to get people to obey. Like if you do this, you, if you leave this, you're going to, you know, like the, the sheep, if you're going to leave the herd, you're going to get eaten by, eaten by the wolves. So stay here where it's safe. 
where the shepherd can protect you, right? I totally get that. And for kids, the whole Santa Claus thing, it, it works, right? Be good, you'll get presents. Be bad, there's consequences. So we're domesticated from a very young age to believe in that. And religion is like the next big thing where we go from belief in Santa Claus being good or being bad and punishment and getting presents to the next big thing is eternal salvation or eternal damnation. And that's hung over your head your entire life. I think escaping that thought process or that belief system is hard and scary. And that's why people are scared to do it. Cause they think, Oh, if I leave the church, I'll get in a car accident, I'll die or I'll just start drinking and I'll do all these bad things. Cause that's what they've been fed their entire life. And the only way to break free from that is to go and experience it firsthand and be like, am I a good person without the church? Am I going to just start killing people randomly? Like <laughs> maybe you should figure out who you are. Like, are you a good person without that? And for me, what, what has happened for me is, uh, and this is why I love, you know, not being part of a religion anymore is because now I choose to do good because it feels good. Like to be a good human feels fulfilling to me, right? Doing things that are bad, um, you know, depending on what your version of bad is, um, I don't feel like doing because it doesn't bring me fulfillment, right? Drinking coffee, I don't look at it as a bad thing at all. Drinking alcohol, I don't look at as a bad thing at all. Doing plant medicine, I don't look at as a bad thing at all. We've been taught those things are bad and that if we do them, we're going to feel guilty. But I know a lot of happy people that do those things. Why aren't they killing people? Why aren't they just miserable? Why aren't they just, you know, sleeping around? You know, I feel like this this idea, this belief system that you mentioned is is a way to control a population to, you know, follow certain, you know, rules. And that's why you look back at the history of religion and how strict religions were. Like if you spoke out against the church in certain situations, you would get killed, right? You'd be punished. You would be, they would try and silence you, right? And now we're in this place where I feel like hopefully people see people outside of the church as, oh, maybe you can't be happy outside the church. Maybe you aren't going to become a rapist and a murderer <laughs> and all these things that I've been taught. And <laughs> that's why you have to learn how to know who you are, discover who you are outside the church, and then also develop um, some self-love. And I feel like if you truly love yourself, you're going to love other people. But if you hate yourself, you're going to hate other people. Everything is a mirror of how we see ourselves. I love that. So if you see yourself and you judge yourself as, um, as this bad person, you're going to see everyone else in that same light. But if you love who you are, you're empathetic towards you, it's easier to love and be empathetic towards other people. And so that's, that's what needs to be fixed is your relationship with yourself. It sounds like you're saying if you really love yourself, you'll treat people kind. Yes, with kindness and love mm -hmm. because it'll be reflected in. Yeah. In, in and I learned that from uh, Don Miguel Ruiz, uh, his book, the four agreements. Um, uh, what's the mastery of love is another good one as well. These lessons are, are from books that I read outside of the church. And that's makes so much sense to me because mm -hmm. back when I was Mormon and I hated myself, I was judgmental towards other people. I would hate other people that I didn't even know. Why? Because I hated myself. Mm -hmm. And so if you understand that, mm -hmm. you can go through this life. And if you can learn to love yourself and realize that you're lovable, you're going to treat other people with love too. And that's how you fix, that's how you fix the human race in my so opinion. So you've become more kind after leaving the yes. church, you feel like? More empathetic, more kind, less judgmental, more it. loving, more caring. I love it. Mm -hmm. So last time we talked a lot about the shame cycle that you were mm -hmm. stuck in for so long and... Um, I'm assuming that, you know, when you messed up, you went to God and went to your Bishop to be in this constant, like put a gumball in and you get, or put a quarter in and you get a gumball out mm -hmm. kind of like circular, <laughs> like I did something bad. Here's where I get the feel good back from yeah. the thing that I did wrong. So when you lose the structure of the church and, um, I'm assuming, did you still have a belief in God after you and like that you could still find repentance through a God mm -hmm. as well? That's a good question. I wasn't sure. I don't, I don't, I didn't know. Cause I felt like, okay, if the church isn't true and the book of Mormon is not true and Joseph Smith isn't the true prophet, then who's to say that God isn't just made up by men as well. So I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't say whether or not I believed in God or didn't believe in God. It's super common to question yeah. everything. Yeah. Cause I'm like, okay, well, wh what is true? Like these scriptures, Bible, the book of Mormon were written, you know, centuries ago. How do we know that it was written, you know, th uh, the way it is to us back then? You know, there's so many 
things to make it difficult to 100% believe, but sorry, that's not your question. <laughs> so I was just trying to explain, like, I think I'm new to this interviewing thing. So I'm going to kind of explain <laughs> it. What was one of the most devastating things to me is I didn't know what to do with the guilt that I felt that I would normally mm. be pouring my heart out to God. And then I could feel repentance. I could mm. feel cleansed of my sin through prayer mm. and I can go about my day again. So with somebody like you that struggled with so much shame and mm -hmm. guilt um, from your past, when you didn't have that structure anymore, what did you do with that guilt? Like I, I felt completely lost. So I don't know if that's like something that maybe yeah. you went through. No, it's a good question. I think it goes back to when I met with my uh, life coach, Catherine Dixon, she helped me develop self-love despite my past, despite all those things that I'd done in the past. I think separating yourself from actions in the past is the, one of the most healing things. Uh, the problem before that was I, was I was attaching myself as those, like I was defined by those actions that I did. And I think that's where you, once you develop self-love, true self-love, you realize that you're lovable no matter what you do, despite like the mistakes and the bad things that you've done in your past. And I feel like if you truly love yourself, you're going to go out in this world wanting to do things that feel good to you, that feel, make you happy and more fulfilled. So I didn't hold on to the guilt and shame. One, I went through the repentance process. Remember, I, I did go through the addiction recovery program, was refellowship back into the church at some point. So all the guilt that I felt, I uh, you know, before that with the affair and the pornography and stuff like that, masturbation, I feel like, um, you know, I went through the church's repentance process where that helped me believe like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm cleansed of my sins in a sense. And then when I left the church, um, you know, learning these new methods of, of how to, you know, look at myself through a new lens really helped me let go of any kind of guilt or shame I had mm -hmm. about my past. Were there ever times where you were you would do something where uh, normally you'd say to yourself, oh, if I was Mormon, I would feel, you know, oh, X, yeah. Y, and Z about this and then yeah. kind of sit with it and realize that there's things that you don't need to feel guilt and shame over and just like completely bask in that self-love and realize yeah. a complete shift of your mentality. Um, so I think that's a huge thing that people struggle with is needing a third party, needing a mediator, needing a God yeah. to cleanse them. And they're not confident enough to just love themselves yeah. and realize there's sins that, that don't need to have this horrible weight on them at all times. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me that kind of happened as I went through this whole rebirth process, if you will. Um, rebirth. Being reborn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. In a sense, like I really do feel like a, a totally new person. Like mm -hmm. the person born I was again. 10 years ago yeah. is not who I am today love at it. all. And I'm grateful for that. So. Love it. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> okay. I need my own catchphrase, John. <laughs> I know. <you> can. <laughs> all right. So really quickly, spirituality. So yes. spirituality for me was like hearing the hymns, go, hearing the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, hearing people bear their testimony. You know, you couldn't be spiritual outside of a Mormon context. Yes. Did you still feel a longing for spirituality? How, if so, did you find a source for spirituality, even a redefinition? Because so many people become allergic to that term. They think some sort of metaphysical thing. They yeah. think it has to be ghosts or something, you know, so it's like, oh, I don't want anything spiritual. And then I think this might be the place to talk about how psychedelics mm. were influential to you because yeah. psychedelics and spirituality sometimes are mentioned together. So talk about all that. Yeah, hundred percent. So I think for me, I found spirituality, which I did enjoy, even if, even if I felt it in the church, I did enjoy those moments. It was didn't happen every Sunday, of course. <laughs> you know, sometimes you're just going through the motions of life. But transitioning out of the church, practicing meditation, uh, positive affirmations, uh, my gratitude lists, my walks out in nature, those things became spiritual for me. Whereas before, when I was Mormon, I wouldn't include those in my spiritual, you know, category. But those things became spiritual for me because I truly believed that they were helping me and I could feel something outside of my body that was influencing me in a, in a positive way down this path. And that's why to this day, I tell my family, even, I don't know if they believe me or not, but I say, I really do believe I was led down this path from God. I'm not being deceived by Satan. He's not, you know, tricking me and pulling me away. I'm becoming this better version of myself. And I think, you know, if God exists, that's what he, she would want, right. Uh, to become this better version of yourself. And so for me, I found spirituality in those other things, uh, outside of the church. And I truly felt that. Um, I would say 2018, 2017, I started to research, you know, I'm in the health and fitness industry. Um, we learn a lot about, you know, health and diet, nutrition, the power of medicine and plants. 
Um, and uh, there was a couple of books that I read that helped shift my perception because once again, my perception of any kind of illegal drug was, oh, you're going to go crazy. You're going to do bad things. You're going to start jumping off buildings. And, you know, <laughs> there's all this propaganda around don't do drugs. And I get it. I get why people think that way. But Opiate maybe, overdose, meth, you know. Yeah, overdose, and maybe you've like, seen it in movies or TV shows or experienced it on the streets where you see crazy people on drugs and you're like, oh, that person's crazy. I'm never doing drugs. But once you look at, you know, the research, the science behind it, you realize, okay, maybe we, we haven't, we've been lied to about certain things. And this kind of ties into my research into the ketogenic diet. I'm a big proponent of keto. I, I have a, my own keto book. Um, you know, I coach people on the ketogenic diet. Not, th not saying it's like the one and only diet for all humans, but it's a great tool. But we've been taught that fat is bad for us our whole life, right? Low, eat low fat. That's the way to go. We had the food pyramid, remember? And what did that do to society? We became even more obese <laughs> from the 70s yeah. and 80s on when we started, started introducing these low fat, uh, you know, products in the grocery stores. Obesity just skyrocketed, right? So I was learning about keto and how we've been taught this lie about how fat is bad for us. I was like, hmm, okay, that's weird because I remember as a kid telling like, hey, limit fat, fat's bad. Because like, you think, oh, e eating fat makes you fat. With psychedelics, it was very similar where I'm like, all right, we've been told not to do drugs. I get it. And then I read this book called Stealing Fire, which talks about achieving a flow state and how to achieve a flow state. And there are certain people in this world that can achieve a flow state. Uh, they talk about uh, Navy, T Navy SEAL teams and how they're able to work as a unit and achieve this this flow state that they can track and record. Uh, some of like the best athletes in the world, they are in this flow state when they're on fire. You know, like when Steph Curry or LeBron James can't miss a shot, they're in this flow state that they can achieve, you know, by tapping into this, um, um, this ability to be in this flow state. And maybe there's times where you or I have experienced that. And there's, and in the book, he talks about different ways to achieve that flow state. And, you know, breath work is one of them that he talks about, but also plant medicine, right? He talks about different plant medicines and how they're able to achieve flow states using these plant medicines, medicines in a safe way. Also the book, how to change your mind. Michael Pollan. Yes. Really good book on learning about, okay, maybe even him, you know, he had these perceptions of certain drugs that are bad for you and why, but he questioned that. And he's, I think what he's trying to say is maybe we should question that. And now you look at MDMA therapy and how that's um, on, uh, shoot, I always feel like phase Ketamine. three. Oh, yeah. right, right, right. Phase Johnson three Hopkins. trials. Yeah. Right. So they're doing trials with PTSD patients and it's super powerful, right? And, and, and it probably will be legalized at some point. Same thing with medical marijuana. It's being legalized. And we were taught that marijuana, remember, was a, a gateway drug and it's very bad. And now we're like, oh, well, actually, there's all these health benefits to it. Maybe we should research it a little bit more. So all I'm saying is, like, I became more open to the possibility of using a plant medicine, and I heard about ayahuasca. And ayahuasca is this plant medicine, usually from the Amazon uh, area down south, and a lot of ancient uh, uh, cultures would use this for ceremonial purposes. And uh, there was this company called Rhythmia, and they're down in Costa Rica, and they invited me to come experience uh, an ayahuasca um, a, a week long ayahuasca retreat. Let me, can I back up? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so um, let's just say you're you're no longer. Well, by the way, <laughs> there are a lot of Orthodox Mormons that are now experimenting with psychedelics. So it's, it, you know, um, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a, a progressive or a post Mormon activity anymore. Yeah. Um, but let's just say you're trying to live your best life and your mind's mm -hmm. open to new experiences. You've in, in your case, you left the church. Mm -hmm. Why were you even wanting some sort of foreign substance versus just like exercise, eat right, live happy? Was there something going on in your life where you were sad or you had anxiety or you were dealing with some sort of traumatic symptoms? Yeah. What Was there a core need that made you feel even an openness or a desire to, to experiment with something like, like plant yeah, medicine. Yeah, that's a really good question. No, actually, when I did ayahuasca, I was in a really good place emotionally. I had done the work. I'd done lots of therapy and life coaching and lots of work on myself. And I felt like you don't need plant medicine to get there. You can do therapy and life coaching, and like meditating, reading books, all those things. Those things can be beneficial. The research that I found on certain psychedelics 
was intriguing to me and it made me curious. Maybe there's so an just experience. Curious. Yes, just curious. Maybe there's an experience that I haven't had yet in this life and maybe now have this opportunity to experience this, to, you know, take this to the next level maybe. Um, but I felt like, or I do feel like people can achieve, you know, healing without any kind of plant medicine, for sure. Even people that practice plant medicine will tell you that. And that's why when I went to Rhythmia in Costa Rica, they had four nights of ayahuasca, but they had three nights of breath work. And all you do in this 60 minute breath work session is the monk there that teaches you how to breathe in a very, it's a very heavy breathing and very uncomfortable. Your mouth gets really dry, but it puts your mind into a psychedelic state. And so they teach you how to achieve that without any kind of medicine. And people listening to this might be like, okay, that's weird, but look it up. Your body can achieve an altered state of mind just through breath work. And it's powerful. I saw people in there crying. I saw people in there having uh, revelations. So, they saw things and just with breath work. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and how to change your mind talks about that as well. Yes. Why would let's, why would you want an altered state of mind? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of like psychedelics 101. Yeah. And, and by the way, religion, religion capitalizes on this. So if you just want to think about it for a second, yeah. whether it's whatever did or didn't happen to Joseph Smith or Mohammed or Jesus or followers of a religious tradition that have those moments of deep spirituality, yeah. you can kind of get the answer there. But just for those who are listening, why would you even yeah. want a psychedelic experience? Yeah. Here's my belief. And this is just my two cents. I believe that... Um, these plants are on this earth for a reason. And if you look at the coincidence of ayahuasca, for example, combining some bark with the leaf of a certain tree, like d just magically combining those, you get this drink that puts you into an altered state. What are the chances of, you know, humans figuring that out at some point in time? I don't know. And, and, to having, the, and having the neurological <laughs> receptors where yes. they could even have that experience. Exactly. It's almost yeah. like our ba our brains, our bodies were meant to take these substances where we have these receptors where the capacity, we can. Yeah. Exactly. And so for me, I and I'm a big fan of um Ben Greenfield who's in the health and fitness industry. He's a very strict Christian guy, but he's a big believer in psychedelics and plant medicine. And so I I I always like listening to him when he talks about it because even though he's still super religious, I am in the same boat where I feel like Okay, if there is a God, he maybe there, there's substances on this earth that were meant to help us. And I do see a lot of these psychedelics and plant medicines as powerful uses to help us. And maybe altering your state of mind is what you need to see your life, your lens, your situation you're in through a new perspective. Because when you're not in that altered state, you're in the same uh, loops in your in your brain all the time. Same programming, same loops. And this can help break those loops for some people. I'm not saying it's a miracle or anything like that, but I feel like there are different methods, just like there are different religions and there's different ways of thinking. I don't feel like there's just one way that's going to fix all humans. Maybe there's multiple ways that humans, uh, based off of our past and our experiences, can benefit from whether it's substances or a set of beliefs or you know an organization like a church. Maybe there's all these methods that are used to help all of us. Yeah. That's my two cents. And I've, I'll just disclose, I've never tried psychedelics at all. I am yeah. curious about them because like every post-Mormon friend I have has mm -hmm. tried either psilocybin or mushrooms or mm -hmm. uh, MDMA or ayahuasca or what's the one, um, peyote. You know, there, yeah. there, are, <laughs> there are all sorts of these. Yeah. And when you read How to Change Your Mind, it's so fascinating because you learn, number one, that we as a species have been doing yeah. <laughs> for millennia. Yeah. Some, some argue that that's how we distinguished ourselves from other primates yeah. through, and that, that, you know, that who, who knows if that's yeah, true for sure. Yeah. But more importantly, uh, one of the things that was most fascinating for me to learn from how to change your mind was that when religions found out that humans were using them to have transcendent experiences, the religions clamped down, made those things forbidden, and punished people who used them because the religions wanted the monopoly on yeah. the transcendent experience. Yeah. They only wanted you having a transcendent experience in the context of their religious tradition because that gives them power over you. Yes. But the one thing that I'll just say is, so to answer, to, to supplement or augment what you said, yeah. Not because I've done it, but just because yeah. I've, I've read about it and talked to lots of people. If you are 
just having chronic anxiety, if you're having chronic depression, mm. if you are stuck in ruminating intrusive thoughts that just you can't get out of, if you've had certain sorts of trauma that continue haunting you and tormenting you, or if you just feel like you're stuck in a rut and need some sort of transformation, what I'm hearing you say is, and what I think the scientists are now trying to develop and gather data around is, sometimes having a psychedelic experience with psilocybin or mushrooms, with, mm -hmm. um, with MDMA, with ayahuasca, can provide you with what people like to say can amount to years of therapy yeah. in one evening or in a couple evenings yeah. that can really, that's why Michael Pollan called the book, how to change your mind. It can literally help you in an accelerated way, way yeah. rewire your brain in ways that become really healthy for you. Is, yeah. is that? Yeah, that sounds perfect. That sounds great. And I actually agree with that. And that's why you see these studies being done. That's why you see mushroom psilocybin being decriminalized in certain states. That's why you see medical marijuana being legalized in so many states, because we're starting to really realize that there are benefits to these. Now, with that being said, we're not just saying go and do it, you know, without any kind of supervision or just take as much as you want, like anything, any kind of substance taken, you know, uh, the wrong way or too much can lead to bad, you know, things happening. Let's, for example, alcohol. Alcohol is a toxin. I don't care how you spin it. Uh, like drinking one glass of red wine, it's a toxin. But it makes you feel good temporarily. But that we all know what happens if you drink too much alcohol. It's not healthy for you. <laughs> but for some reason, that's legal, right? Uh, but you know, these other psychedelics, these plant medicines, which are totally safe, you know, um, you know, still aren't one hundred percent illegal or one hundred percent legal. Sorry. So, anyways. Um, you, do you want me to go into Costa Rica? No, no, no. Okay. So, so yeah. So why don't we just talk about, so, and just to be clear, listeners, this isn't John advocating psychedelics at all. I've already said that, but more importantly, there's two reasons why uh, we're covering this. One is because Drew, you said mm -hmm. that this was an important part of your experience. Yeah. Um, and so I want to, I want to respect and validate that. Okay. And then the only second thing is, is that, so many people that I know who've left the church and so many reasonably well-expected authors and podcasters are now yeah. starting to talk about this, that to ignore it is to ignore sort of a significant phenomenon that's happening in the world today. So listeners, if you're Orthodox Mormon or super conservative and you're freaked out by the fact that we're talking about drugs at all, this is not advocacy. This is not sponsorship. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is not anything other than respecting and validating Drew's experience because Drew, you're about to tell us how this was really formative for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm grateful for that. And I think that's very important to put that out there. So everyone that's listening and watching understands that this is coming from uh, that place instead of like, Hey, go and do this now. So, um, okay. So Costa Rica, 2018, it's called Arrhythmia. They put you in this, you know, nice place down there. And, um, it's more for, it's more for uh, Westerners, you know, that want like a nice hotel to stay in and want like a pool and, you know, so it's, it's definitely a good setup, but the cool thing I liked is, is it's, um, it's legal in this, in the country of Costa Rica. And, um, so it's, it's, it's medically supervised. So they have a doctor on staff, they have nurses on staff, they do your, they, uh, go over your blood work and make sure that you're in a healthy state to be able to take ayahuasca. And you have to be approved by the doctor, you know? So it's not just like they give it to anyone. And they do it in a very ceremonial way. It was really spiritual how they did it. It reminded me of, of similar things that we do in the temple to prepare as a very sacred uh, preparation um, ceremony that they do for the medicine. So you could definitely tell it was like this reverence that you had to have. Um, it wasn't like at a club or at a rave that we were doing this stuff. <laughs> it was in, in the middle of the jungle. Well, not in the middle of the jungle, but in a nice place in Costa Rica. And you had these shaman that would come in and you take the medicine. Um, so you do four nights in a row of the medicine. The first night, um, nothing happened. <laughs> I took it. It didn't taste good. It's just like a, a dirt tasting tea, <laughs> but, um, nothing happened. And so I was like, okay, that's fine. You know, there's three more nights. So the second night I took a second dose and, um, had probably one of the most powerful spiritual experiences of my life. Talk about in that. this moment. Yep. So, um, you know, you're kind of laid out on these beds and you have 
uh, your own little bed to, to like sleep in and a pillow. And um, so I'm just laying there, my eyes closed and uh, just letting the medicine do its work. And uh, my intention, and that's the other thing when you do psychedelics, I think having an intention is super important. My intention was to reconnect with my soul, right? I feel like as humans, we disconnect from our true selves from the age of like four or five or six where we are become domesticated and we're told who to be by society, by our parents, and we start to detach from that true, pure, innocent form of ourselves. And so I went into it with that intention and it was really cool because um, uh, about like maybe an hour or two in, I see this little version of myself, this five-year-old little boy, and it was me. And um, he came up to me and he gave me this hug <clears throat> and I knew it was having, you know, an ayahuasca experience, but it was real. I uh, could feel him, his arms around my neck, and it was this, <clears throat> like I said, a five-year-old version of myself. And he, and I knew it was me, and he gave me a hug, and he just like wouldn't let. He w he wouldn't let go of me, and um, I said, "How do I?" reconnect with you and he said um by how you treat your daughters he said how you treat them is how you treat me and i remember waking up because it was so profound the boy, the boy. yes it was how you treat your daughters is how you're going to treat treat this inner child, child. Yeah. this inner child which i think we abandon ourselves from that inner child, when we become domesticated as adults, right? We kind of just like grow up. But I think everyone, every adult that's hurting is like this wounded child that's been hurt by not enough love or trauma or abuse. And we kind of detach ourselves from that little child. And so anyways, I woke up and it was so profound. I remember scribbling it in my journal. They give you a journal to write down like things like that. And I was like, wow, that was so beautiful. That was so amazing to be able to talk to my inner child in a sense. And what he said to me was so profound and it really changed uh, my trajectory or my path and as a parent. And for me, that's what I'm saying is like, this was a, a very powerful spiritual experience. You know, I probably wouldn't have had that in the church. I probably wouldn't have been able to experience that. And it was such a powerful experience and it's cemented in my brain now what happened um, in that moment. And it helps me to reconnect with my inner child more and check in with myself. Like, am I getting lost in the hustle and bustle of life? Like paying bills, making money, doing the rat race. Like, am I losing myself? Am I, am I distancing myself from that five-year-old version of myself? And, um, so for me, that was super powerful. And this is actually something that I, 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 when I work with people, sometimes I have them do this practice where I say, Hey, find a picture of yourself when you're five years old and hold that picture in front of you. And the things you say about yourself now as an adult, would you say, would you say those things to that kid looking at that picture of yourself? And it's such a powerful tool for that person mm. to look at that. <clears throat> sorry. That innocent version of themselves would they treat themselves? Would they treat that child the same way that they're treating themselves now? Mm. <clears throat> and I think most adults struggle with self-love probably because we weren't taught self-love as a kid. So anyways, that was a really powerful experience for me. And I try and have my followers that struggle with self-love do that practice where they take that picture out of themselves as a little boy or a little girl. And they talk to the, they talk to that version of, of themselves. So anyways, that was a really powerful experience um, mm. doing ayahuasca. I know people will judge it and, you know, say whatever about it. But for me, it's, it's pretty powerful. So it was beautiful. Thank you. Kara, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm so professional right now. I'm like not crying. Right? I'm just like working, working. Um, <laughs> Yeah, John knows that this is my second day here, and I have a five-year-old child at home right now yeah. with her dad, and it's something that hits close to home because you know exactly how life can just beat you up 
And you want to retain that innocence so much from our children. We don't want that. Um, we don't want life to beat them up, but we know it is. And whether it's the church or whatever else, you know, (laughs) I'm sure everyone who's a parent goes through this where you're like, what are they going to be in therapy in for if we're like, what's the reason they're going to be in therapy in 20 years? And how do I prevent that? (laughs) You know, and thinking so much about like what you were saying, like, how can I give that to my kid now? How can I make sure that I (sighs) prepare them for the world that's going to beat them up, but they'll have all of the tools that I didn't have when I was a child. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Go ahead. (laughs) It was beautiful. Thank you yeah. for sharing. Yeah. I knew I was going to get emotional, but that's it's, a good thing. It's, it's, um, that's my ayahuasca experience. And that's, it was really powerful. You know, so. to, we're, we're later this week, we're going to be releasing an interview with Lance Allred okay. where he talks about, uh, a way to define masculinity in new ways, new, lo- mm. new, new ways to approach masculine masculinity. Yeah. There's this toxic masculinity that men don't cry or that boys shouldn't cry. Yeah. And I think men, showing emotion is powerful and it's healing. And so I'm just really, really, really grateful yeah. that you're willing to model that for us today. Yeah. I'm an open book and, um, vulnerability is strength, you know, that's the, Oh, well, where'd you do that? <laughs> I just saw it. Oh, it's a tattoo oh, on your it's arm. A tattoo on my arm. Right. Yeah. Did you cry getting that? No. no, but it meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to me, you know, and that's why I'm okay being vulnerable and, um, seeing it as a strength instead of a weakness. I think that was a huge shift in my life going from, vulnerability is a weakness and, you know, manning up and that eventually broke me, but embracing it as a strength is really powerful. So it's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So let's shift a little bit to your fit to fat to fit sort of business. Okay. Uh, we're not, obviously you've got a whole podcast on this and books and, um, <laughs> but I want to just give an overview. Sure of your approach to health. And then we're going to come back to the Mormon stuff. We're going to end with some sort of like healing and growth beyond Mormonism kind of stuff. But I want to just spend maybe 20, 30 minutes on the fitness stuff. Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I'll I'll tie it into the story as well, because I think there's some parallels between doing Fit to Fat to Fit, which is a fitness journey, and how that applied to my life as a Mormon and then transitioning out of Mormonism as well. Let's, let's do it. Yeah. So uh, 2011, um, I started my first fit to fat to fit experiment. And what that was, the idea behind that was here I was, someone who had never been overweight a day in my life, trying to help people who were overweight pretty much the majority of their life. And obviously there was a disconnect. I was judgmental. Like, hey, why can't you guys just put down the junk food, go to the gym? It's not that hard. Like... Uh, you just do the work and then you get the results. <laughs> and um, so I, I knew there was an, something I needed to understand. And I had a client tell me, you know, Drew, you don't understand how hard it is for me, for people like me, because for you, it's always been easy. And when he told me that, I kind of took it to heart. I'm like, you're right. I don't understand how it's so hard. I, it feels so easy for me. Um, and I, I would expect it to be easy for everyone. You just do it, <laughs> you know. Um, and so anyways, this idea popped up in my head. What if you got fat on purpose? What if you did this experiment, documented it? Let me let me ask though. Were you already a fitness guy at that time? Yeah, I was a personal trainer. Okay, so you start out. So just to just to kind of get into the story. Okay. And we talked about some of this last time. Yeah. So you are a personal trainer by this point. Yep. And you're just working with people individually. Yep. Right. But then I think you said last time that you were having people were challenging you on your ability to really have empathy yeah. for the people you were working with, right? Yeah, one hundred percent because. You know, what did I know about how hard it was? I would just thought you just put down the junk food, put down the soda, and you go to the gym, and it's not that hard, right? That's kind of the mentality that I grew up with, too, with sports and the culture that I grew up in was like, hey, you do these hard things, and, you know, you don't complain about it. And I had that willpower, that discipline. And But anyway, so that kind of got me thinking of ideas, and this idea of getting fat on purpose, I know it sounds crazy and ridiculous, made sense in my mind. It was like this light bulb went off, and I'm like, oh, it almost felt like a calling to do this. Like I almost felt like this was a calling for me to do. And so I embarked on this journey, six months, no exercise. I ate a standard American diet, lots of cinnamon toast crunch, lots of Mountain Dew, lots of hot pockets and Doritos and Cheetos and, um, you know, mac and cheese. And, um, you know, what else did I have? Uh, top ramen. You and know, were you exercising delicious. during all this no, time? No exercise you for stopped six months. So this is like a... The McDonald's guy that did the, what, what was that called? Morgan Spurlock, supersize me. Supersize me. It's yeah, kind of yeah, like that, right? He did it for 30 days and he just ate McDonald's every day, which that would be miserable. <laughs> um, but he almost died, right? He got super serious, got super uh, unhealthy. Anyways, I was doing it for six months, but I didn't focus on fast food. I wanted to focus on 
you know, white bread and white pasta and like, you know, low fat cereal or like low fat skim milk, like all these things that are marketed to us as health. How about Diet Coke? Yeah, Diet Coke. I drink lots of Diet Coke. That get, that's awful stuff. Yeah. I mean, not, not to judge, but. No, no, I know what you mean though, but like so many people eat these foods. So I try to focus on the foods that are affordable, cheap, convenient, and they freaking taste good. Like, I'm not gonna lie, Cinnamon Toast Crunch is I one of my it. favorites. Yeah. so delicious, you know? Um, so I ate that food for six months. I gained 75 pounds in six months. And by this time, the story kind of went viral. Like uh, people were having me on their TV shows and, you know, we How'd talked about that. How'd you get the that. word out? Just word of mouth, to be honest. I got lucky. I I, I did have, uh, I got a book deal with Harper Collins at, at like about three, four months in, and they assigned me a publicist. So that did help out. But before that, I was already booked on the Jay Leno show, Tonight Show. Just by gaining weight? Just by gaining weight and people sharing my story. Were you Instagramming this or YouTubing Instagram it? Instagram wasn't How? around in 2011. It was just Facebook and YouTube. You, you were Facebooking and YouTubing. Yeah, that's What's it. What's your YouTube channel or what was it? Fit then? to fat to fit. Okay, okay. It's the same. So so the the original videos are just you chowing down <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and see. just gaining lots of weight? Yeah, you'll see. And they're all there right now? Yeah, they're still there. Okay, you, okay. You can go back and look at the old. I mean, quality wasn't that great because it was just yeah. me and my wife at the time filming with her phone and uploading and editing it like it. It's probably pretty horrible, but it still exists. And yeah, it went viral. But here's the thing. Gaining the weight wasn't the hardest part of it. You know, it was losing my identity. My identity was based on my body. So my body image was my self image. And I think if you grow up your entire life in shape, yeah, that's going to be par become part of your identity. And you had pretty much always been fit. Yep. Played okay. football and wrestled right. since I was a young kid, yeah. 11 brothers and sisters. We all played sports, you know, and so I was always fit. And, um, uh, you know, and then becoming overweight, uh, that was hard for me. I'll be honest with you. I freaked out. Like I would go up to people in public or I would want to and, and explain to them, <laughs> uh, why I was overweight. Like I would say, Hey, this isn't really me. Here's my before picture. Go to this website. This is just an experiment. Was that partly because people were treating you differently? No, but in my were mind, they though? were they treating you differently? No, no, they didn't really. No one was really mean to me. Cause I think in society, men aren't judged so much for having the dad bod or being huskier. I think women are judged more harshly than men. Would you agree with that? As so far true as yeah, works? yeah, yeah. And um, not to like put a damper on um, how fat you were. Um, <laughs> I went up and watched some videos, and you barely looked different. Like you, because you had enough clothes on. I guess when your shirt's off, it's different. But when I'm sure you, when you're wearing your <laughs> shirt, your neck was wider. But like yeah. physically, it didn't seem like you were like you were not obese by any means. Yeah. You know, like you just were very, very heavy. And so I think you probably projected, I'm assuming that you were 200 pounds heavier instead of what, 60 pounds heavier. Yeah. That's a lot. 60, 70 pounds is still he a lot. He still looks pretty good point. though. Yeah. Everyone go Google it. <laughs> no, thank you. I appreciate the compliment, but it was definitely noticeable. If you go back and look at my old footage on Jay Lynn or Dr. Oz, people still think it's photoshops, you know, but, um, the identity thing was really important because, you know, I kind of lost my identity. I freaked out. Uh, like this isn't me, this isn't who I am. And, um, that was a parallel into, you know, me leaving the church, which happened, you know, a few years later, but the identity crisis thing is real. Like that's really hard for people to deal with when you lose your identity, whether it's you, your body changes, right. Or you lose a religion or whatever it is, there's this identity crisis where people kind of can go into this realm of, of confusion and hate and, ang and self hate and anger and resentment and the mm. victim mindset or mentality and people can get stuck there. Right. Uh, for me, with fit to fit, I knew it was temporary, right? Um, I knew this was going to be over soon, but it was still really hard for me in the moment, that first experience. So I, you know, went on all the TV shows, wrote the book. Um, we actually had our own TV show that I created called Fit to Fat to Fit, and it, it was on A&E for two seasons. We put other trainers through that process. But the biggest lesson I, I took away from this whole experiment was that transformation is way more mental and emotional than we think. I know people that go into weight loss transformations thinking it's going to be physical, like, okay, I need to eat this many calories. Here's my macros. Here's my workouts. And here's my supplements. And if I do these things, my body will then look like this. But they're not factoring in the human aspect of all of that. And that's the emotions. The emotions of life don't go away. And for so many people, we programmed our brain to deal with emotional pain by using physical substances to numb that pain, whether it's food, drugs, alcohol, sex, porn, TV shows, movies, social media, you name it. We have so many things at our fingertips. When we deal with emotional pain of life, we've programmed ourselves to drink some alcohol, have some cake, eat some ice cream, 
And you do that for years and decades. And then guess what? When you're 30 years old, 40 years old, and you're 50, 100 pounds overweight, and you're like, okay, I got to change. You're not, you're, you're, you're looking at, at it wrong by looking at it as just a physical transformation. And you have to eventually deal with those uncomfortable emotions and learn how to release them. Because if you don't, if you hold on to those, that hate and that anger and that resentment, and you hold on to that abuse and the trauma that maybe happened to you, it's way harder to be strict and, and live a healthy physical lifestyle unless you learn to release those emotions and deal with them through therapy or life coaching or you know, plant medicine, whatever. The physical stuff becomes so much easier when you deal with the emotional stuff first. So when you had gained all that weight, first of all, did you did you ever fear that you wouldn't be able to lose it again? And then the second part of that question is, was it harder to lose than you thought it would be? Uh, yes and yes. Okay, so, talk about both of those. <laughs> I remember I was on the Dr. Oz show at my heaviest. I was like 269 at this point. And um, I seriously doubted if I would be able to get back. And I was freaking out. I had a little bit of stretch marks on my love handles. And I was like, you know, a little bit concerned. Like, what if this doesn't work? And like, I went all on all these TV shows and they're like, oh, he's still stuck. He's st he, he got fat and now he's stuck. I had those doubts. I had those thoughts. But I just had to trust the process and have faith in the process, right? that eating healthy food and exercising again, my body would bounce back. So I was worried. Second question was, um, was it harder to lose? Was it weight? harder to lose yeah. weight? Yes. I, I kind of compare it to being on top of this mountain my entire life. Like here I am, this fitness guy up here. And then all my clients are down at the bottom and from the top, it looks so easy. Like, Hey, just follow this path, you guys, and then come up here where I am. And it's not that hard. Right. But for me, for the first time coming down off that mountain, Starting at the bottom was a whole new perspective. And that journey up that I thought was easy from the top was way harder than I thought it was going to be, right? The discipline, the, you know, the, the huffing and puffing during the workouts, being sore and tired. And that's why I'm such a, a proponent of bringing more empathy into the fitness industry because people don't realize how hard that journey is. People don't realize how hard that trans transition is. And so here I am, someone who's normally fit and healthy that can do that kind of lifestyle, telling everyone that this is this journey of physical transformation is way more mental and emotional than we think. And it's way harder than we think. So let's have some empathy for those that struggle with weight loss and body image issues. So how long did it take you to gain the weight? Six months and six months, six months to gain six months to lose. Okay. And then, and then, so talk about losing it. First of all, talk about, I, I, so I've lost 25 pounds. Yeah. I've been able to keep it off. Um, I, I fluctuate, you know, over a week I'll fluctuate plus or minus two or yeah. three pounds. Yeah. It's been hard for me to just keep it at a certain weight. Yeah. I actually kind of want to lose a little bit more, mm -hmm. but one of the things I've learned is that it's mostly about food. Yes. I used to, I've always been an exerciser. Margie has always been, you know, getting me out, walk in and run in, you know, lifting weights or whatever. And I've been doing that forever, but it's, it, it never really changed anything for me. It was the food. So, yeah. um, so for you, what were the core components of losing the weight and then go into detail about the emotional aspect sure. and how you had to better manage the emotional aspect? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. So just, just for, oh, sorry, just for the record, I've done this journey twice now. Right. I just did it recently. I actually just finished it a week ago. I've done it as a 40 year old and I did it back in 2011. Cause people, why, why'd you do it the second time? Cause people, were, um, you know, I, I doing it at one, I, I was a lot younger. My metabolism was different and my, you know, I was, you know, had youth on my side. Um, but also social media wasn't what it is today. So not a lot of people saw it back in 2011, right? There was no TikTok. There was no Insta stories. There was no Facebook live. So I wanted to do it again to really bring home this message of having more empathy for those that struggle. And that was my vehicle doing it, doing it a second time to bring more empathy into the fitness industry. So, um, so, okay, overcoming the emotional aspect, with, especially with food. And this is, man, this is why the emotional connection to food is, I think, what stops most people. Okay, it's wait, not... before you talk about the emotional, what, how did you eat mm -hmm. to, lose, to lose the weight? Yeah, so in 2011, uh, I did a, I wouldn't say a bodybuilder approach, but it was a high-protein, low-fat, moderate-carb diet where you ate every few hours. So six meals a day. Six meals a day. This is 2011. The first time. Yep. And yep. what types of meals? Give us some examples of the types of oh, meals. Oh, like, um, you know, a green smoothie for breakfast with some protein in it. Um, you know, 
uh, some snacks that were like hard boiled eggs and some vegetables. Uh, you know, lunch. Was, what types of vegetables? Mm, cucumbers, celery, uh, maybe some saute like broccoli or asparagus. You know, boring vegetables. <laughs> no, I love vegetables. Okay, awesome. I Most love people it. don't. Um, yeah, okay. But like, yeah, you steam some vegetables, add a little bit of salt to it. Um, and then, you know, maybe some type of lean meat, like chicken or turkey or uh, something that didn't have a lot of fat. So an egg white omelet or something like that. And fast forward to this time, now I'm a proponent of keto. So I'm doing high fat, moderate protein, low carb, and I eat twice a day. So give us an example. Yeah. Of- so intermittent fasting, I'll have like coffee in the morning. Okay. I'll eat lunch, which usually consists of like an egg scramble. So eggs, vegetables, and maybe some sausage. And then for dinner, maybe some grass. What vegetables do you mix into your eggs? Yeah. Yeah. In my eggs, spinach, I'll do mostly spinach and... Um, Spinach, cauliflower, broccoli, or Brussels sprouts. Mm, yeah, you yeah, know, absolutely. and mix that up with some bacon or some sausage. Not potatoes. No, no, because with ketosis, the goal with ketosis is to achieve a state of ketosis. In order to do that, you need to cut out carbs. Right? It's our body's backup system when we don't have. If you run out of fo- uh, food, John, you're not going to die tomorrow. You can last probably a month or two, maybe longer, mm-hmm. without food. People don't realize that. Yeah. So that's what ketosis is: is our burning our stored body fat and turning that body fat into energy. And and so keto is a diet that mimics fasting, uh, but you have to cut out your carbohydrates in order to mimic fasting. So uh, some people are either afraid of or concerned about uh, ketosis or keto because it's like, oh, bacon, meat, <laughs> grease, fat. Yeah. And they think cholesterol and is this good for your heart? Does ketosis have to be super high fat? Can it just be healthy proteins yeah. and vegetables, but but not greasy fat? And is there risk if you're if you're eating the super high fat greasy stuff? That's a good question. So it's very individual, but I will say this: similar to what I talked about before, how we were told fat was bad for us, where we thought like, oh my my uh, arteries are going to clog, we'll get a heart attack, like it's not safe. That myth has been debunked. If you look at newer science um, and based off of these older studies, the old studies weren't uh, formulated in, in a way that would work, right? Because they, they didn't account for other macronutrients. So high fat diet meant a burger and fries and a milkshake, right? So they're eating high fat, but look at all the carbohydrates that are in that food as well. If you look at the newer studies, you do a ketogenic diet with low carb, Right, it's totally safe, but I'm not. I'm not saying go eat bacon, go eat sausage, go eat like just drink the grease or <laughs> chew on butter. Like that's how people think it is. You can definitely do a lower fat version of keto and still achieve ketosis. But there's different ways of doing keto. I'm more in the middle ground where it's like, hey, if you're gonna do keto, do it by eating whole foods. So eating these vegetables, whether you eat a lean meat or a steak, for me isn't the most important part. You can get your fat from avocados and. Things like that. That's more plant-based. Uh, coconut and um, uh, olives as well. Olive oil. You can get your fat from that stuff too. You don't have to get it from bacon and and uh, fatty cuts of meat. You know. Okay. So. So but you anyways. were talking about the lunch. Anything else you want to say about dinner? Oh like- yeah, and dinner would be like maybe like a grass-fed steak with yeah sautéed asparagus or you know uh, mashed cauliflower you know instead of mashed potatoes. And you're avoiding. I assume you're avoiding like breads, yep. white flour. Uh, rice and yep. potatoes. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Anything that has a large amount of carbohydrates. I'm not saying those foods are bad for you. That's not what I'm trying to say, but when you're trying to achieve a state of ketosis, you do need to limit carbohydrates. So those things have lots of carbohydrates in them. So you can have them, but probably in really, really tiny amounts. <laughs> uh, you want to keep your carbs 30 grams or less for most people to achieve a state of ketosis. If you keep your carbohydrates 30 grams or less, your body will start producing ketones because there's not enough glucose to fuel your brain, muscles, organs to function properly. And so, um, yeah, to achieve ketosis, you need to cut down the carbs quite a bit, so 30 grams or less. And so from there, your body's in a state of ketosis where it's burning fat as energy instead of burning sugar, which is what carbohydrates get turned into. They get turned into glucose in the body, right? You're burning fat as energy instead of sugar as energy. And explain really quickly the intermittent fasting and why why two meals yeah. a day works for you. Yeah, when you're in a state of ketosis, you're not nearly as hungry as when you're eating carbohydrates, right? So when you eat carbohydrates, which gets turned into glucose, glucose is kind of like if you threw lighter fluid on a fire, your your body like the fire goes up really high really quick, but then it falls back down really quick too. That's glucose. Your body burns through it really fast. 
when you're in a state of ketosis, those ketones are kind of like logs or coal of the fire that stay hot for a long period of time. You're not getting these big bursts, but also that, that flame lasts a, a long time, right? And that's kind of what ketones do for the body. So you don't feel as hungry as often. If you're eating lots of protein, lots of fat, little carbs, you'll, you'll feel satiated longer. So that's what I like about ketosis is I can eat once or twice a day. My brain is sharper. My digestion is better because I'm not having to eat every three hours. I give my digestive system a break. And, you know, keto is anti-inflammatory as well. And there's a lot of health benefits for, there's lots of studies on Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and uh, PTSD, traumatic brain injury, um, migraines even. There's lots of research being done on keto. And also keto was discovered in the 1920s to help uh, children that had severe epilepsy. So we all know, you know, there's the, the Charlie foundation you mentioned, right? The, that movie with Meryl Streep, what's it called? Remember that movie with Meryl Streep back in the day? Mm, not Lorenzo's oil. No, no, it's a different one. It's based, it's based on Charlie, the, who they started that foundation oh, okay. after. Okay. So anyways, uh, yeah, it's, it helps with uh, severe epilepsy as well. So what, what do you need? What, what are some basics people need to do for exercise that, that, or is sustainable. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is like, I <laughs> sure there's like lifting weights, which is going to help out men and women, but I know it turns a lot of people off. Um, if, if, if I were to prescribe something to people listening, something sustainable, any kind of resistance training, whether it's your own body weight or whether it's weights at the gym is going to help in the long run because your metabolism is based on how much lean body mass you have. The more lean body mass you have, the higher your metabolism is. So the more muscles you have, the, the more calories you burn at rest. So for me, with my muscle mass, I can burn, you know, I don't know, 24, 2,500 calories a day if I didn't move a muscle. So that means if I ate 2,400 calories a day, I would maintain my weight. And, and that's without moving a muscle, right? If I exercise on top of that and I'm moving, doing laundry, walking around the house, I'm going to burn more, more calories than that, of course. So, you know, I'm eating closer to like 3,000 calories sometimes. Does that make sense? Totally. Yep. So. Okay, so now let's go to, let's say our listeners are like, okay, now I know the diet, mm -hmm. now I know the exercise, talk about the emotional component and how, yes. what what emotions came up for you then yeah. and will come up for our listeners, and then how did you deal with or cope with those emotions? Yes, 100%. So <laughs> uh, the emotional connection to food is is really hard to break. It's like any addiction, just like drug addiction or anything like that. That's why I have so much empathy for those that struggle with it, because unlike drugs, food is legal, Right. And you can get it anytime you want to. And at the tip of your fingertips, right? It's Uber Eats. You can go to the restaurant. You can go to a grocery store. And like I said, when you deal with emotional pain in life, some of us reach for something to numb that pain. And for a lot of us, it's food because, like I said, food is very accessible. It's convenient. It's cheap. And it tastes good. And it makes you feel good. I went through that experience myself. I went through a really hard breakup during my second Fit to Fat to Fit journey. And I remember eating Ben and Jerry's uh, dairy-free Netflix and chilled ice cream, which is amazing, by the way. Don't go buy it because it's very addictive. <laughs> but when I went through my breakup, I was sad, lonely, and depressed. And there was this moment where I'm like, eating this ice cream makes me feel better, literally makes me feel better. And so to break that habit for people to say, okay, now I'm going to be healthy. I'm going to cut the sugar out. They don't factor in the emotions of life and how those are going to play into their, their physical weight loss journey. And so to break that is really hard. Here's the key to overcoming any kind of addiction, and that is self-awareness. As you become more self-aware, you learn who you are and you learn why you do what you do. So self-awareness can be built in many ways, therapy, life coaching, meditation, journaling, uh, becoming the observer of your thoughts. And what happens in those moments where you become the observer of your thoughts and you build that self-awareness. Now when you're, your kids are freaking out, they're stressing you out, your spouse is driving you crazy, you're struggling with finances, you're like, dude, just give me some cake and give me some wine. Like, I need some, I, need, I just need to relax, right? In that moment, when you become the observer and you've be, have built that self-awareness, now you can take a step back and breathe for a second and say, okay, what's happening here? Uh, my kids are triggering me. This is triggering me. It's bringing up these emotions. And now instead of just reacting and going for it and then stuffing your face with all this food mm. and then you feel guilty later, now you can play it out in your head and be like, all right, do I want to go down that path? Maybe, maybe sometimes it's worth it, right? Like maybe sometimes it is worth it to just be like, screw it. Give me a drink. Give me some food. But in that moment of, of building that self-awareness, you're in, more in control to where you can thoughtfully respond and be like, all right, is this what my higher self wants? Do I really want some ice cream? And maybe, like I said, sometimes you do. It's all about intention. But 
at least you're more in control now, uh, becoming the observer of your thoughts and building that, that self-awareness. So meditation, positive affirmations, gratitude lists, journaling, getting out in nature, those things that All I mentioned. All those things that were helping you in your religious yes. transition yes, helped you in your fitness. Yeah, and it helps other people as well in their fitness because a lot of people – you know, they, they work with me and they think, okay, what are, my, what are my macros? What exercise do I do? What are my calories that I eat every day? It's like, okay, first, what, 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 what haven't you let go of in your life? Like, what are you dealing with that is going to come up? Is it your finances? Is it your spouse? Like, what causes you the most stress? And learning to deal with that first and foremost before if I just give someone meal plans and workouts and say, here, do it. Mm. I know that at some point after three weeks of like uh, being consistent, that those emotions are going to come up again at some point. And then that, then they go through this vicious cycle of, of binge eating and then feeling guilty and beating themselves up more and saying, why can't I get this body? Why can't I look this way? As if, if uh, the problem is our perception of success, we look at health and fitness as, Oh, I'm successful. If I get this body, like once I get this body, then I will be happy. Right. And we look for these outside sources of happiness, whether it's religion, whether it's uh, the perfect body, this much money, these things are going to make me happy. Like these things are going to fill those holes that exist. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to tell people is that's a myth. Just like chasing after money, we know that's a myth. Right. I know a lot of miserable people at 5% body fat that still hate themselves. So getting the body isn't the answer. It's learning to operate out of a place of self love, loving who you are now. While you continue to work on this better version of yourself, you know, while you continue to, um, you know, um, you know, find this, uh, this best version of yourself as you go through life, as you upgrade and, and progress, I believe that people can be happy now, first and foremost, where they are, um, even though life isn't perfect, even though they don't have the perfect body, they don't have the money they want, they don't have all the, like, all of the things checked in place, um, they, you know, I feel like I can teach people how to become happy and fulfilled now even though they don't have the perfect body, you know, and you can love yourself now, even though you don't have the money or the lifestyle that you want. Like that's the, kind of the myth. I'm uh, the cycle I'm trying to break in the fitness industry. Yeah. It's like trying to diet when you've got major life problems you haven't resolved yeah. is like putting a band aid on a gash. Yeah. You have to address the major laceration, get it cleaned, get it stitched up. Yeah. And, and then, you know, then the other sorts of things have a chance of working. Yeah. But, but if you're going to bleed out, a Band-Aid's just <laughs> probably not going to help you, right? Yeah, and there's a good book called The Body Keeps the Score mm. um, about trauma and how that affects our physical bodies. And I think that's a really, really good book to understand. That's okay. one you recommend? Yeah, I went through this traumatic experience or this abuse or whatever it was that happened to you. And just being aware of, of how that you know has affected you your whole life, how that has affected your body. And like I said, some people abuse food just like we abuse drugs and it numbs the pain temporarily. And I don't condone that behavior. All I'm saying is I understand it on a whole nother level now. And I can empathize with those that struggle with food addiction. The problem that we have is, is people judge are so quick to judge someone that's large or obese. Cause they think, Oh, what's like, why can't you fix your problems? You know, or why can't you just eat less food and work out? It's like going up to a drug addict and saying, why don't you stop doing drugs? Like, it's not that hard. You just stop it. It's like, we all know that's not the truth, but with food addicts, we're we judge them harsh, more harshly in our society, and unfortunately, because you're defined by what your body looks like. And I'm trying to break that cycle or uh, disrupt the fitness industry by letting people know, one, it's harder than we think it is. We need to have empathy first and foremost and uh, understand that, um, you know, everyone has their own mental and emotional issues that they're going through. And, yeah, this one person's um, – you can see how it manifests on their body – and maybe for you, you hide it well with, you know, in different ways. So all I'm saying is we need more empathy. And if we could learn to have empathy for ourselves, first and foremost, it's going to be easier to have empathy for other people too. Love it. So. Oh, I was just going to say, it's funny sitting over here as the only woman in the room when you guys were talking about um, that uh, food is the number one thing that you need to watch out for to control your weight. And I'm over here thinking how a year ago. Today, I was eight months pregnant, and I'm like, you guys know nothing about being fat. You guys know nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I don't care how much weight you've gained. Uh, yeah. No, just kidding. But uh, yeah, not getting pregnant is my most important tip <laughs> for not feeling yeah. fat. <laughs> I am done having kids. But um, yeah. but yeah, to that point, though, like uh, as a woman who I am so happy that you're bringing up a lot of these things about how if you have a whole 
crap. I have a video about filling holes that people keep referencing. I can't say filling holes ever again. (laughs) (laughs) I can't. If you have something missing within you and trying to go to an external source and thinking that the perfect body will make you happy, I am at least happy that a long time ago I heard a uh, a TED talk by a former supermodel, I think, Mm -hmm. and she talked about if you think that having the perfect body will give you complete mental clarity and happiness, I can show you a room full of supermodels who have the tightest abs, like the best thigh gaps, and they're all miserable. And I heard that when I was 20 years old and I'm like, okay, whatever my body is, I'm just going to make sure to love it as it is. And I have, I have as a woman, as just anybody, you have at any given time, 10 problems that your brain is trying to figure out and like having so much grace for whatever stage your body's in and not yeah, not completely forcing it in a uh, uh, square peg into a round hole at all times of what yeah. you are, what your perception, you love using the word perception and now I'm like, <laughs> catching <laughs> yeah. Up to it. yeah, whatever your yeah. perception of what you think it should be at any given time that it has to be and like giving yourself grace for whatever period that you happen to be in in your life. Yeah. So that's my feminine take Amen on it. to that. Yeah, it's perfect. That's a great way to, yeah, that definitely you, I think you worded it a lot better than I did. So. I didn't. Yeah, that was I'm, great. I didn't. You, <laughs> you have a podcast. You're so good at talking. Uh, you have a great uh, way of articulating yourself, Drew. Thank you. Well, this is great. So, yeah. um, so I mean, we could talk about fitness forever, yeah. but yeah. but I think that gives people maybe a book mm-hmm. and some resources. If people want to, I want to get back to the Mormon stuff. Sure. If people want to understand the basics of your program, yeah, they go where? Just fit to fat to fit dot com. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All so right. It's super simple. Super and good. on social media and, you know, t- fit to fat to fit. Okay. So, all right. So let me ask you this. So mm-hmm. when you, number one, when you've been a Mormon, it's hard to decide if you're going to leave the church. Do you come out at not there's come out or not? Yeah. There's so many people that keep it a secret. They don't want to anger or disappoint their parents, their grandparents, their friends, their siblings, their yeah. community, maybe their job, maybe their profession. There would be financial risks by coming out. So just being Mormon or in any high demand religion and contemplating being public about your disaffection or leaving is fraught. But then if you're an influencer, you know, every view, every follow can be really precious, especially when you're trying to build something and there's so much competition out there. I imagine that deciding to come out um, publicly with, with fear of that influencing your business even ups the stakes more. So going back to your story now, how did you decide if to come out, who to come out to or not to come out to and how to come out? Mm. And then, and then how did that go? Yeah, that's a good question. This actually, I consider this my coming out moment to be honest with you okay. of the church. I've, so you waited, never, you waited. I've never used my platform to talk about my religion. So okay. I've never once said, Hey, I'm Drew the Mormon, right? Like I never once talked about religion on my platform. So in my episode on my podcast, episode 100, I did talk about how I did transition out of the, my church and left my religion. But this is my first story of like really getting into the details, to be honest with you. So this is kind of like my coming out moment, even though I left years ago and people could kind of tell I started getting tattoos and talk about drinking coffee and I would you know promote these like ketogenic wines that I that I drink. And so people could tell. Right. But I never publicly said, hey, guys, I left the Mormon church uh, and here's why I've said I've left my religion. I, you know, it was um, it wasn't something I wanted to make a big deal about because one, I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to be defined by that, by either I am a Mormon or I'm not a Mormon. Um, but it was just a part of my story. Now coming out to my family, that's a whole different, that's a whole different conversation. But basically coming out to my family was really, really hard because I told both my parents at the same time. How long uh, ago? 2015. Oh, wow. I, I called them on the phone and told them about my divorce. I told them for the first time about my affair. And I told him about my issues with the church all in one phone call. <laughs> That's a lot. And that was, yeah, that was heavy. That was really hard. I'm, like I said, I'm a crier and I, it was hard for me to get through sentences because I was crying so much because it was so traumatizing for me at the, at the time, you know, and it was really hard to talk through it. But it, you, like, you know, when people describe a feeling a hundred pounds lighter, I literally felt so much lighter after that experience. It was so hard. I was shaking. I was nervous. I was crying. I couldn't like finish my sentences. It was really, really hard for me to open up and talk about it because I knew it would, it would hurt them. I knew it would hurt them. And did it 
probably. I remember uh, I was I was listening to you. You mentioned the last podcast about your most popular downloaded mm-hmm. podcast was your hundredth one yeah. hundredth episode. Um, and I listened to that this morning, and you mentioned how when they found you, uh, you came home from Christmas, and they found a picture of you drinking, and oh, you yeah. realized that you never wanted to. You're like, okay, I'm never talking to them about anything again. Had you had a pretty closed off relationship with your parents up to that point, and this was extreme, like extra difficult. Yeah. I've never had a close relationship with them and we just didn't know how to talk through things. I was very private and quiet about my issues. You know, I just pretended they didn't exist. And then when they found that picture of me in college drinking at a party and we had that uncomfortable conversation with them in their bedroom, it was really, really hard for me to ever open up to them, them again after that. Like I felt so ashamed that they found this picture of me and they knew I was drinking in college and I just wanted to jump out the window. So like, I couldn't even look at them. I had to look away and just, it was, it was a really hard experience for me to go through. And like I said, they did the best they could, you know? Um, and I don't blame them, but at the same time, it was really traumatizing for me because I didn't feel like I could ever trust them or talk to them about things I'm experiencing. It was just like, Hey, don't do this because you're stupid. If you do it, you know, that's kind of my experience from that. But this experience, like talking to them on the phone after my divorce, was really hard because it was finally me telling them the truth. Like, this is me. Like I got divorced. Uh, we're getting divorced. I had an affair. I don't know if I believe in the church anymore. And it was just Mm -hmm. like a coming out, you know, situation where I was like, this is me. And, you know, they, they did the best they could. They're like, we still love you. And, you know, and said all the, the nice things. And it was, um, I felt so much better after that, but to this day, it's hard to have a real conversation, you know, with them. And, um, what did my, it do for you to come out to them? What did it do for me, man? That was so healing because it was it was this whole life I've lived was wearing a mask, right? Of who I'm pretending to be, and to take off that mask and say, "This is me," like here I am, and I still love myself. That was really really hard, uh, but it was so worth it because one hundred percent worth it. Because on the other side of that is happiness, fulfillment, authenticity things you can't be when you're stuck in this, um, this place where you're, you kind of have to pretend, you know, and I don't want to do that anymore. I don't, it broke me and I've done that path. I've tried it. I've, you know, it's not like I didn't have enough faith or I didn't pray enough or I didn't do something. It was, I've tried that path. It just did not work for me and it broke me. And now having, you know, said my piece to them about it, it was like, okay, now I can be me. I can go in this life and be me and not have to worry about feeling guilty or ashamed and hiding this or that from anyone in my life. Like I want to be as open as possible, talk to my kids about everything and have that relationship where like, you know, they like, and, and just say, this is me. This is, this is who I am. And I love myself. And if you don't love me, that's okay. I don't judge you. You know, that's, that's not for me to control, but that's for me to, strive for in this life is that self-love. So, yeah. Can we, can I just jump sure. in and say that we talk about filling the holes. We talk about the serious emotional wounds or sources that drain you in life of emotional energy, of happiness, of, of comfort, of security. Uh, and this is just a message directly to my listeners, yeah. being inauthentic, living a lie, wearing masks, Hiding who you really are um, is toxic. Yeah, it drains your energy. It causes anxiety. It causes anger, mm-hmm. and I believe that chronic illness, uh, autoimmune diseases, all sorts of mental illnesses, again, anxiety, depression, mm-hmm. can emerge from living these false lives, hiding things, and not being authentic. And so, it is. You know, think about. Healing from a trauma, yes, do that. Think about getting getting medication for a, a severe mental illness, yes, do that. Eat right, exercise. What we, I think, minimize is the physical and the emotional and the psychological cost of living an inauthentic fake life. Now, yeah. is that true or true or false? <laughs> for me, it's 100% true because that's what I experienced, right? That's what I lived. And you can justify it staying in that place of inauthenticity, like, oh, it'll make my parents proud. It'll make this person happy. It'll make that person happy. But I like I might not lose some money. Yeah, exactly. I might not lose some friends. (laughs) Right? 
Yes, and like it comes back to Teddy Roosevelt stepping into the arena, the man in the arena. Like that's so scary. It's easier to stay back in the stands and just watch from the sidelines, if you will. But to get in the arena is freaking scary and it's hard. But that's where the growth is, and that's where I feel like you can find true fulfillment in this life, and um, it's worth it. So it was scary for me to come out and talk about that episode one hundred. Uh, that's when I got this tattoo. Show and, the show the audience. Show um, show. How can they? Can you? Just, yeah yeah. Yeah, that I, works. I'm yep. not trying to flex my muscle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> flex your muscle. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> no, but what does it say? Vulnerability is strength. Yeah. And I I 100% agree or How is that, that true? Like we're all taught that mm -hmm. to 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 show to to admit your weaknesses, to admit I mean you admitted freaking adultery on yeah. national international <laughs> YouTube, you know. Yeah. Like how can that be strength to show your weakness? Yeah. That, that's counterintuitive. Yeah, I get that. Um, for me, it is because we talked about the whole mask thing, the whole stepping into the arena. That's really where, um, that's really where it counts, and that's really where you find your true self. And you could play the games and wear all the masks in this life, but I feel like if you do, you're, you're I don't know. I just feel like you're you have this one opportunity that we know of, right, <laughs> to live this life as authentically as possible. Like I feel like if there is a God, that's what He wants us to do in this life is to not just blindly follow and, and pretend to be someone that you're not, I feel like we, we were meant to be this version of ourselves. And I promise you it's scary, but once you do it, it's so freeing and it's worth all the, the fear and all the, all the, you know, worries you have. So, so anyways, love it. And on the topic of, you know, assessing where our mental health problems might come from, where our autoimmune dis disorders might come from and realizing, Hey, maybe instead of like putting a bandaid over the glass on our foot, let's like take out the glass. Let's analyze where this is coming yeah. from. And it could be the church. It could be a myriad of different things. And I just wanted to read a comment from the live stream right now. Sure. Um, uh, this uh, person says, Sorry, I need to speak into the mic, don't I? <laughs> uh, agreed on figuring out that the mental stuff, in addition to fitness stuff, I couldn't successfully transform my body through nutrition and exercise until I figured out my gender identity and started transitioning. Now that I identify as a guy, I am loving fitness and easier to love my body and make uh, conscious choices that align yeah. with my goals. Wow, so beautiful. I thought that was a really beautiful comment. Thank you. Yeah, tell them thank you, whoever that is. Yeah. Shout them out. Yeah, that's, that's something <laughs> that's awesome. that... Self-knowledge is just something we don't ever often think to do in a high-demand yeah. religion because it's not about understanding who you are. Yeah. It's about, wait, what are the rules? What are the standards? <laughs> what are the expected behaviors? Yeah. What's the expected identity? Okay, let me be so busy doing all that yeah. that we never stop to ask, who am I? What do I care about? What drives me? Yeah. And that's a beautiful comment from, from our listener viewer. So thank yeah. you so much for sharing. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, at the end of the day, since we're like, rounding this up, it ties back into the inner child thing. Like we lose who we truly are around that age because we're, we become domesticated animals almost. And we're told who, to, how to behave throughout society. And, and you see that you'll see, like I've seen my, my girls even that are 11 and nine slowly kind of detach from that pure, innocent, you know, five-year-old self that, that we all once were. And, and it's, it's hard to tap back into that. Luckily I've been able to tap back into that. But I catch myself getting lost in like, I got to pay these bills. I got to do this to make money. I got to, you know, look like this. All these expectations that life puts on you, you can lose yourself in that. So all I'm saying is like, you can find yourself through through religion. I believe that 100%. You can find yourself through all different methods. But I feel like, you know, I feel like whatever works best for you, then awesome. I believe you, right? But also believe whatever works best for me too. Yeah. And that's where we need to have empathy for others. And, you know, you can have empathy for someone that, maybe stays in Mormonism 100%. Like if that's your true belief that you feel like that's where you need to be, then I'll support you and love you through all of that. Right. And you know, I, I would want the same thing in return. So, um, anyways, love it. Yeah. So let's do a quick lightning round. I'm going to okay. ask you where you've landed on a few things. Okay. So where have you landed on God? No right answer. Yeah. I don't know, but I have hope. That there's something after this life, um, but I don't believe 100% yes or 100% no. Okay. I'm open to being wrong. <laughs> uh, how about Jesus? Where have you landed with Jesus? Same thing. Uh, I don't. I'm, I don't know really. Um, I you know there's scriptures and the stories about him uh, about him being a real person, um, but 
like I said, I don't, even if I do believe in him, I don't know what that would mean. Like, okay, does that mean I join the Mormon church if I believe in him? Or do I join a, a Christian church because I believe in him? I don't know. I don't, I never met him in person and I, I wasn't there at that time when those things happened. So for me to say, I don't know, just means that I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like I wasn't there. And, and, and are you okay with that? Yeah, I'm okay with that. Well, how are you? Like 100%. some people are like, oh my gosh, if you, if you lose your faith in Jesus or in God mm -hmm. or in the afterlife, why even live? Like <laughs> you may as well just pack it up and yeah. end your life because if I don't know that I'm going to be living after this life, and if I don't have a purpose and meaning that my church has given to me, yeah. then what's the point? Yeah. Life is so crummy, I may as well just end it. For me, it's not so much trusting in Jesus Christ as the Savior. It's, it's trusting in the stories that we know about him. The stories that we know about him are based on certain men's perceptions of maybe an experience or a story that they heard or they wrote about, they saw thousands of years ago, and... All I'm saying is, is I don't know if I trust the people that wrote these stories. It has nothing to do with Jesus. It has everything to do with the stories that were written about him and how they've changed or evolved over the years. Like, who knows? Who knows? And so, like, all I'm saying is if I, if my, if my, um, if I'm dependent upon getting to heaven, if that's based on my belief in Jesus Christ or not, then, okay, then that's a weird, unfair judgment, I think. But because there's millions of people who don't know who he is you know, or, or never heard of him or, you know, never met him. And I just feel like it's, it's, I don't, I wouldn't want to believe in a God that's like, oh, you had your chance to follow and you did it. And therefore you're damned for eternity. So I'm fine with that knowing to be totally honest with you. It makes me feel so free to say, I don't know. So what's the purpose of life for you? Why, why bother? I don't know. But all I know is it feels good to be good. It feels good to do good things and to help other people. That's for me, the most fulfilling part of this life is the giving to other people, making them feel happy, loving myself. What's the purpose of this life? I don't think anyone knows. <laughs> What's the purpose of your life? To be the best dad I can be and to show my girls uh, how they deserve to be loved and to help other people out as much as I can through my social media platform, through the videos I do and the content I create. Um, share with them what's what's worked for me. And I think as humans, it's up to us to share that knowledge of what's worked for us and pass it on. And, and maybe it'll help other people and maybe it won't stick and it won't help other people. But for me, I don't have to, I feel like I don't have to put a definition on why are we here? Where are we going? Where were we from? Who's God? Who's Jesus Christ? I feel like, I feel like we don't have to put a definition or a label on all that. It's my belief. And if this live stream went out to nobody except for me and the three of us in this room, <laughs> I would have been like <laughs> experiencing so much elevated emotion and so uh, so enlightened by everything you've said today. So you. you're feeling it's been the really spirit. Good. I've been feeling the spirit. Yeah, I need to grab more tissues over here. Sorry. For me, for me, when I had my faith crisis and went through the depression, converting that into a purpose, yeah. which has become Mormon stories, yeah. was a crucial part of my own mental health and growth. For you, yeah. has how has fit to fat to fit provided you with that meaning or purpose or fulfillment, or has it? Yeah, one hundred percent. All these lessons that I've shared on this podcast that I've learned over the years have come from my own personal journey, my own personal faith transition, if you will, that have really. Uh, have been applied into my life and I pass on to my followers lives as well by giving them these tools that can help them whatever religion they are or la or if they're not even part of a religion all these these tools can be applied into all areas of life and that's kind of how I've become who I am today um, because of my personal experiences all right so so there's a lot of people out there either going through it right now they're yeah. going to be going through it or they're in the middle of it or they're like, Maybe some people are flailing. What is some final advice you can give people who are either contemplating a, a change in their relationship with their religious mm -hmm. tradition or are in the middle of a change? Just some closing advice, words sure. of wisdom for people who are really in the thick of a big yeah. transition. Man, first of all, everyone that's listening, you are worth it to fight for your happiness, whether it's inside the church or outside the church. And I feel like if you could develop self-love, like it's never too late to love yourself. I don't care if you're 70, 80 years old, you can still learn to love that inner child that we talked about and really tap into that. And I feel like if you can tap into that and connect with your your soul, if you will, 
uh, I feel like you can look upon other people with the same kind of love and empathy that you can develop for yourself. And so if you operate out of a place of self-love, this life will be so much more fulfilling because we don't really know what's going to happen after this life. So, um, you know, I know a lot, a lot of times in scriptures it says, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Like, or, hey, you, yeah, you can do that too, but also love and live and give to others and uh, learn how to be fulfilled. And it starts with loving yourself first and foremost. Uh, and I believe that you can truly do that inside and outside of Mormonism. And um, I feel like that's how this life was meant to be lived. And I feel like you will be, your relationships in your life will change so much better if you operate out of a place of self-love versus self-hate. And so that's kind of how I, I would end this. Beautiful. Thank you, John. All right. So how do people, if they want to read more, learn more, yeah. how, tell them one more time all the ways they can uh, check you out. Yeah. Fit number two, fat number two, fit. And that's everything. Just Google that. Instagram, TikTok. Twitter, yeah. YouTube, TikTok, TikTok, Facebook, Facebook. You got a couple books, right? Yeah. A couple of books, fit to fat to fit, same title. Uh, and complete keto is my other book. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. Any and a lot work? of this stuff that I talked about is included into my programs or that book. Um, all these methods that I talked about. So beautiful. Yeah. Kara, any final words? Uh, today I listened to the 100th episode and then right after that of, of his podcast. And then right <laughs> after that is, uh, his ex-wife Lynn, yeah. um, giving her, I think it's like a top 10 words of wisdom of things that she learned, yeah. um, post faith transition, post divorce. And I wish, I wish <laughs> I could pump that information into everybody's Let's brain put it in the show notes. as well. Yeah. 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 Um, we'll, we'll put those episodes of the show notes. It was, it's, it was really a beautifully condensed, uh, words of wisdom of everything that she'd learned from a lot of things in an, in an hour podcast. Yeah. So I'd really recommend people go check that out too. Yeah. yeah how, many pe mind. how many people could have their ex spouse on a podcast and yeah. like they're like, like we, I kind of, we kind of began this way. Yeah. Not only are you guys still having a good relationship and co-parenting productively, you're, you're bringing them on and giving them part of your platform. I'm not sure a lot of our mm -hmm. listeners who have been through a divorce have that sort of relationship with their ex-spouse, not to shame them. Yeah. In some instances, that's literally not possible, depending on how reasonable and healthy the people are. Yeah. But what a beautiful model to do that. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate that. I'm glad you listened to that. I think if anyone, you know, my first episode, we focused a lot on the affair. Go listen to episode 100 if you want to hear more about like the the what happened. And then also episode 101, if you've been someone that has been cheated on, Listen to Lynn's episode because her episode is very, very healing so that you don't stay stuck in that victim mindset for the rest of your life, even though what happened to you was wrong and bad and horrible. And and yes, you have every right to be mad, but go and listen to her episode because I feel like it maybe can help a lot of people who have been in that situation. Yeah. Any, I think she was talking about even just generally anything that you need to overcome and you need to have grace for yourself, that things are going to go back and forth, that growth is not linear and just yeah. so many good takeaways from anyone going through any kind of, whether it's a faith transition or a divorce or yeah. any person who's in need of healing. I think that podcast she did was like completely amazing. I'll let her know. Yeah, she's and a Lynn, good woman. This is an open invitation. <laughs> if you want to come on Mormon okay. stories, open invitation. We That's will have one. you. We would love to have you. Okay. All right. Well, um, Thanks, thank you so much uh, for coming on Mormon Stories podcast. This has been brilliant. This is going to help so many people. And and uh, thanks to all your viewers who have come to watch Mormon yeah. Stories as well. We really, really, really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Drew man. Drew Manning, right? Thank you. Yes, that's me. <laughs> keep, up, keep up the good work. we Will do. And if you guys ever get out to Hawaii, let me know. That's where you're, gonna, you're moving there. I'm moving there in June. Okay. So we'll miss you, man. Do Mormon we'll Stories, you. Hawaii edition. You know. <laughs> How does that sound, Kara? I have been trying to tell my husband that's what we really need is uh, Mormon Stories, Hawaii All right, edition. We'll so work, on, work that. on that. All right. Thanks, Drew. Yeah, thank you, thank guys. Thank you. See you soon. And listeners, thank you so much for joining us today on Mormon Stories podcast. Uh, email us at mormonstories at gmail.com with any feedback. Uh, thanks to everyone who donates financially. Uh, Unfortunately, only like one out of a thousand listeners or viewers actually donates and we're losing donors every month because people, people either move on or COVID or whatever has made it so people have had to discontinue. So if you value this type of programming, we would love your support. 
Uh, go to mormonstories.org. There's a donate button at the top on your mobile or whatever. Click on it. Become a monthly donor. That will allow us to pay for Kara, to pay mm -hmm. for Gerardo, our cinematographer, to pay for Brooklyn, our editor, to pay for the space, all this equipment. We need your financial support to keep this going. Please become a monthly contributor. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. It's uh, tax deductible in the U.S. We're transparent in our finances. And literally every penny we receive from you, we feed back into this program. So please, uh, please become a supporter, share it with the world, give us positive reviews wherever you can, share links, word of mouth is great. And most importantly, just love each other and love yourself and uh, let's all heal and grow together and find uh, joy and happiness wherever we are in or out of the Mormon church or wherever. So again, thanks to the listeners, support us if you can. Drew, take care. Thank you. All right. See you and, soon. And Kara, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks guys. All right. Take care, everybody. We'll see you guys soon.